we move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 3712 in the name of Graham Simpson on Scotland's ferries. And I, I would ask members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Graham Simpson to speak to and move the motion up to 11 minutes, Mr Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When the former Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee published its report into the construction and procurement of ferries in Scotland in December 2020, it concluded there had been, quotes, a catastrophic failure in the management of the procurement of vessels 801 and 802, leading it to conclude that these processes and structures are no longer fit for purpose. That was no small claim from a cross-party committee and one that should have made government and all its agencies sit up and take notice. The committee called on the Scottish Government to commission an independent external review of the processes for public procurement of ferries. It did. That report, Project Neptune, has been completed by Ernst & Young and is being sat on by Transport Scotland. Jenny Gilruth promised to publish it when I asked her about it last month, yet Transport Scotland continue to get their way. We demand that it is published in full immediately. The committee also called for Audit Scotland to review the management of that ferries contract and the role played by Transport Scotland. That review has taken place and its conclusions published today are damning. I will start with that, but will also deal with the wider issues here, because at the heart of this, the SNP Scottish Government is letting down islanders and those who need to get to islands. It can't go on. Today, the Auditor General has been scathing in his criticisms. The report lays bare the shambles of this ferry contract. Ministers were warned not to give the contract to Ferguson's. The cost is two and a half times the original budget, with ministers tied into paying whatever it takes. It could go higher. It has today by £8.7 million, which is not a drop in the ocean. There are major failings at the shipyard, which still need to be resolved. This report leaves the SNP hold below the waterline when it comes to their record on ferries. Now, Stephen Boyle has said this today. He says the failure to deliver these two ferries on time and on budget exposes a multitude of failings, a lack of transparent decision-making, a lack of project oversight, and no clear understanding of what significant sums of public money have achieved. And crucially, communities still don't have the lifeline ferries they were promised years ago. He goes on, the focus now must be on overcoming significant challenges at the shipyard and completing the vessels as quickly as possible. Thoughts must then turn to learning lessons to prevent a repeat of problems on future new vessel projects and other public sector infrastructure projects. His report says what we know, of course, that the project to deliver two new ferries has been fraught with problems and delays over six years. Vessels 801 and 802 were originally expected to be delivered in May and July 2018, respectively, and they're now almost four years late, and we've heard about a further delay. The total cost of the project is currently estimated to be at least £240 million, confirmed earlier, which is two and a half times the original vessel's budget. And there is apparently no limit to the final cost, despite what the Cabinet Secretary said earlier. According to the report, the Government is committed to paying any extra costs, regardless of the final price. Mm. Scottish ministers announced Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited, I'll refer to them as FMEL, as the preferred bidder for the £97 million fixed price contract to design and build the two vessels in August 2015. Fixed price, if only. But the contract notice for the design, construction and delivery of the vessels was advertised in October 2014. We've been told today that both boats will be delivered next year. Even if that's true, it will have been nearly 10 years in total 
by the time they take passengers. We've designed and built rockets to take us to the moon and back quicker. The Auditor General says that in September 2015, FMEL confirmed that it was unable to provide Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, CMAL, with a full refund guarantee, which was one of the mandatory requirements of the contract. Although CMAL subsequently negotiated a partial refund guarantee with FMEL, it remained concerned about the significant financial and procurement risks this created. CMAL had the option to reject the bid at this point and told Transport Scotland it wanted to restart the procurement process. Transport Scotland alerted Scottish ministers to CMAL's concerns and the risks of awarding the contract to FMEL. And the Auditor General says, quotes, there is insufficient documentary evidence to explain why Scottish ministers accepted the risks and were content to approve the contract award in October 2015. So CMAL thought there were too many risks to award the contract, but this government thought it knew better. Why, when the Ferguson's bid was the highest, why, when the Ferguson's bid was the highest, and when the government's ship-buying arm said no, did ministers plough ahead? And I asked the Cabinet Secretary this earlier, but got no answer. And I'll take an intervention. Kenneth Thank Gibson. Thank you much uh, for taking the intervention. I was just wondering, did the Conservative Party oppose the award of that contract to Ferguson Marine at the time? Graeme Simpson. <coughs> I would say to Mr Gibson that ministers should be listening to the experts. Perhaps if they had, we wouldn't be in this mess. Perhaps, perhaps if they had, we wouldn't now be ordering ferries from Turkey. Then, no, then there was the £45 million loan to FMEL. We don't know what good that did. And as things went belly up, the government decided to nationalise the yard. But they had absolutely no idea what the condition of the boats was when they did, so could also not have predicted how costs would rise. And despite advice from PricewaterhouseCoopers, there was no exit strategy, a bit like Presswick Airport. This is scandalous. And throughout, we've had the various parties in this squabbling like children, unable to get on. There's been a string of disasters here, with the latest being the discovery that the cables which were fitted on the vessel launched with blackout windows by Nicola Sturgeon in 2017 are now too short. No one has accepted blame for that. No one has accepted blame for anything in this fiasco. Ministers and others, including the highly paid and mistitled turnaround director, have moved on, but nobody's head has rolled. And this is the problem. There is no accountability. None. Not just in Ferguson's, but in the entire ferry system, and especially in government. To get to the bottom of this, we need a public inquiry. There's a telling sentence in the Audit Scotland report. It's this. The two new vessels and sub subsequent additions and disposals were expected to reduce the average age of CMAL's major vessel fleet from 21 years to 12 years by 2025. So how are we doing there? The average age of the CalMac fleet is 23 years. It's got worse, and nobody's head has rolled. We need new ferries, and we need to increase the budget for that to catch up. Graham Day reckoned it would take £1.5 billion over 10 years. We're saying £1.4 billion. That would create a pipeline of work that could herald a boost for Scottish shipbuilding. Presiding officer, this is not some obscure, obscure topic. Having an ageing and unreliable ferry fleet affects people's lives. And I've been speaking to island campaigners on Aaron Mole and I own her this week. A psychotherapist told me he's dealing with increasing numbers of stressed out patients. Others have said they've not been able to get hospital appointments because you can't book a car space less than a few weeks in advance. It's also affecting tourism, and, and, and I've heard of bare shelves in shops, and I've seen the photographic 
evidence. Farmers can't get feed and they can't get their animals to market. It goes on. Kids can't get to school. People are thinking of giving up island life altogether under the SNP. Now, um, yes, quickly. Rachel Hamilton. Graham Simpson. Well, I've actually just said that. Um, people are now thinking of giving up island life altogether. That's, I mean, that's, it's tragic. I'm going to end with a personal testimony from a lady on an island that I haven't mentioned so far, Cumbrae. She told me, we're only an eight-minute journey from the mainland, and this nearness and our small size results in heavy reliability on the mainland. We do not have the infrastructure on the island that other islands have. Residents require to travel to the mainland for secondary schooling, work, medical, dental, optical and veterinary services, as well as supermarket food and petrol. The service in recent months has been the worst in living memory. And she says, I'm aware of a lady who missed a mastectomy operation due to a sewage issue on the ferry and at least two other ladies that have had their chemotherapy impacted. We need a solution now. I disagree with that lady. We needed a solution long before now. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Jenny Gilruth to speak to and move Amendment 3712.2 up to nine minutes, Minister. Presiding officer, I, I, I want to start by thanking Graham Simpson for securing this important debate on Scotland's ferries. It is a timely one, given the Cabinet Secretary's statement this afternoon on the Audit Scotland report. And it is necessary that I listen as Transport Minister to the Opposition and engage in a, on a collaborative basis on the best way forward. Now, both Mr Simpson and Mr Bibby know that this is the approach I am adopting with regard to public ownership of Scotland's railways, and it will not surprise either that that is the spirit in which I intend to take forward the necessary changes required to build resilience in our ferry fleet and to provide that reassurance to our island communities. For our island communities, I know our ferries are not just boats. They are lifeline services, bringing food and vital supplies. They are onward journeys to family and essential hospital appointments, as we've heard. They are a bridge across our sometimes tumultuous seas, and it is vital that government, where it has responsibility and accountability, gets this right for those who live on our islands. So I want to start with an apology, presiding officer. I am sorry that this winter has not provided islanders with the services they deserve and that they should have had access to. I am sorry their needs have not always been fully met. And I am sorry that when things have gone wrong, islanders have not always been communicated with appropriately or in a timely fashion. Now, I am acutely aware of the need for government and CalMac to improve in this regard. And whilst I cannot wave a magic wand and make our fleet more resilient overnight, I am intent that we deliver a better service. And working with our island communities, I will explore every possible avenue to do just that. I have heard loud and clear the concerns and difficulties that have been faced in the recent prolonged period of disruption. And it is important to reflect the combination of an unprecedented series of named storms, as well as considerable disruption on the network as a result of the impact of the pandemic. Now, on weather, when I say unprecedented, I note CalMac's own observation that they have seen more weather disruption in the first seven weeks of 2022 than in the whole of 2012. And much like our railway network, climate change is impacting on our seas and on our ferry fleet. Indeed, weather and COVID-related incidents combined for around 92.75 per cent of the disruption experienced in January and February alone. And whilst it is important to note that these disruptions have been caused by factors out with our control, the impact of extended maintenance requirements and breakdowns due in part to the age of the fleet must also be addressed. And I will come to this point shortly. Yes, I will. William Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful. Just very briefly, when will the Project Neptune report be released, Minister? Minister. Mr Kerr, for his uh, intervention, I will come to that shortly. I've already given Mr Simpson, of course, an assurance that it will be released and it will be published in due course. Now, whilst it's important to notice, um, apologies, I've, I've covered this point, presiding officer, while noting the undeniable challenges facing Scotland's ferry fleet, I do want to express, though, my ongoing thanks to the crews and the staff of CalMac. I know they are working hard in what have been extremely challenging circumstances, and I am sure that members across the Chamber will join me in this sentiment. Now, as the Government amendment notes, this includes commending the vessels' masters for the key role that they are trained to play in ensuring people's and vessels' safety 
with the decision they make about how and when ferries can sail. However, regardless of the seasons for cancellations, the impact on communities is clear. Whether a lack of fresh produce in the local shops or missed hospital appointments on the mainland, we must do everything we can to avoid or to mitigate against service cancellations on the network. Happy to do so. Alistair Allen. Thank uh, the Minister for giving way and I appreciate the tone of, of much of what she has said about accepting uh, the need for uh, more responsiveness on the part of CalMac and CMAL. Does she agree that CMAL and CalMac would be more responsive to communities as organisations if there were any board members of those organisations who had to use a CalMac ferry in their daily lives? Minister. Uh, I recognise Mr Allen's interest in this matter, particularly given his, his own constituency. I'm broadly sympathetic to that suggestion. I don't want to um, decide upon that uh, right now in the Chamber. However, I do recognise some of the challenges here in terms of Islander voices informing the work of CalMac uh, going forward. Now, regardless of the reasons for cancellations of services, the impact on communities has been made very clear to me, whether that lack of fresh produce, as I mentioned, or those hospital appointments being missed. I want to come on to talk about some of the specific services that have been impacted. We have heard, I think, today about services in Arran, but I am also um, well cited on some of the difficulties in Barra, on Cymru, I think we have heard about Colin Tyree. I will be meeting with CalMac uh, next week following our initial meeting last month to raise those concerns directly and also to seek an action plan for improvement. And, Presiding Officer, I want to give members an offer today. If they would like me to raise specific constituency cases with CalMac directly, I would ask them to email my private office and I will ensure they receive an update and an assurance from CalMac that their concerns have been adequately addressed. I have also asked CalMac for regular briefings regarding vessel cancellations and further through officials have requested an up-to-date understanding of their approach to COVID on vessels and the impact this has had, because this has uh, also been raised with me. There is furthermore a need for, I think, a joined up cross portfolio working on resilience, working with the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs in the islands, has set up further working across government to establish what more can be done to better prepare for known resilience events, building on the already well established engagement between government and local resilience partnerships. But it is important to note that the age of the fleet has been a significant contributing factor in cases of breakdown or in extended periods of maintenance or dry docking. And ministers do recognise the need to address delays in investment in uh, ferry infrastructure, which is why, of course, we committed to the £580 million in the infrastructure investment plan. Now, I would like to make some progress, but yes, Mr Simpson. Graham Simpson. I am very grateful. Does the minister uh, not recognise concerns that that £580 million is nowhere near enough? You actually need to at least double that budget. Minister. Sorry. I recognise what Mr Simpson has argued for. I also recognise, however, that the Conservatives voted against, of course, the Scottish Government budget, which increased funding for our ferry services and support to improve our ports. Now, I'd like, I'd like to make some, some progress if Mr Bibbu um, would allow. Now, this investment will enable the delivery of improved infrastructure, which includes three ports on the Sky Triangle, bringing greater resilience and allowing a wider range of vessels to be used. It also supports the delivery of the new Isley vessels and associated port improvements, with both elements allowing increased capacity alongside improved efficiency on the route. And the Isley programme was developed following detailed community engagement, and indeed that has led to a decision to invest in a second vessel. Now, we have also been able to use this investment to realise an opportunity to secure an additional vessel in the fleet um, of the MV Utney, which is now the MV La Frieza. I would like to make some progress, please, following extensive worldwide searches on the market by CMAL. And this secures an island-focused year-round timetable, as requested by the Mull community. But it also frees up other vessels that can then improve services to Sky and South Uist. Both have been welcomed actions from the local community. Now, CMAL, Transport Scotland and CalMac continue to work with communities and key stakeholders across the network to develop the required projects to a point where they are ready for investment. And I recognise that we have been previously criticised for not engaging early enough with communities on these decisions. But I hope, Presiding Officer, that this work therefore demonstrates where we have made significant improvements in our approach, a point noted by the Ferry Communities Board with reference to the Isle Vessel experience. Presiding officer, I'd like to make some progress. Um, since 2007, our investment in ferry services has exceeded £2 billion to provide new, uh, new vessels, improved infrastructure and underpin our Clyde and Hebrides and the Northern Isles ferry services. Since the ferries plan published back in 2012, we've seen the addition of new routes such as those to Campbelltown and Loch Boisdale, as well as significantly increased frequency in sailings on routes to Arran and Mull. 
But the island's connectivity plan offers government, and I think opposition, the next opportunity for greater delivery for our island communities. The ICP will publish later this year, and it will replace and enhance the current ferries plan. It will build on the ferries plan progress, and it will refresh the strategy guiding the ferry services for which the Scottish Government is responsible. When published, it will look at that longer-term investment programme for ferries and ports that will aim to improve wider resilience. That engagement is already underway on this. I would like to uh, make some progress with discussions taking place this morning with stakeholders from both networks. And I, again, want to provide the opposition with an opportunity to feed into the ICP's development as on rail. And I would welcome the chance to speak directly to party spokespeople. I am aware of my time. I have 10 seconds left, I think, to better ensure a collaborative approach going forward. Presiding officer, before I conclude, I did assure, I think, Mr Kerr um, that I would come to Project Neptune. So as part of our drive for strategic improvement, we did commission, as uh, Mr Simpson alluded to, an independent review of the current legal and governance arrangements for the existing tripartite of Transport Scotland, uh, CMAL, David McBrain and its subsidiary CalMac Ferries Limited, who currently operates the CHIS network. Now, as Mr Simpson knows, I have committed to bring forward a statement to Parliament to this, the, to this end. I did receive the report from officials late last week, and along with the relevant Audit Scotland recommendations now, we will consider options for report, reform and improvement. However, Project Neptune does potentially offer options for structural changes to how we deliver some elements of our ferry services. And given the complexity of these and what each option might mean for the bodies and staff involved, I am not going to set out the detail of that today, but I do want to reassure members that I will be launching further engagement with key stakeholders on those options following a statement to Parliament as previously committed to. Could you please conclude, Minister, Deciding and officer, in closing, move the I amendment. want to recognise the vital uh, importance of Scotland's ferry network to our island communities. It is imperative that government gets this right and is honest when we don't. And as Transport Minister, I am absolutely committed to listening to the needs of our island communities and acting to make the improvements necessary. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call on Neil Bibby to speak to and move amendment 3712.1. Thank you, President Officer. At the outset, can I welcome the Scottish Government's reference to the situation at P&O Ferries and their amendment. Labour MSPs, whether here in Parliament today or at Cairn Ryan earlier, stand shoulder to shoulder with those workers and their unions, the RMT and Nautilus. P&O executives have behaved utterly disgracefully and should be hunted down to the full extent that the law allows. This should never have been allowed to happen, and as Labour's front bench in the House of Commons have made clear, this would be not be happening if there was a Labour Government. P&O executives must be held accountable for their actions. President officer, speaking of accountability, I welcome the debate this afternoon brought forward by Graeme Simpson. The ferries fiasco is one of the biggest issues facing Scotland today, one that the Scottish Government has been dodging for too long. The ship has sailed on the SNP's excuses. Scotland's ferry fiasco is a national humiliation. A Scottish yard supporting Scottish jobs and owned by the Scottish Government has failed even to make the shortlist to build ferries in Scotland. But this is a national humiliation with serious and profound local consequences. A reliance on an ageing CalMac fleet means islanders have to endure the human cost of breakdowns and delays. Young people missing school, sick people missing hospital appointments, families being kept apart, island businesses losing income, and we have all seen the pictures of island supermarket shelves lying empty. All of this is a threat to island life, as Graeme Simpson said. It undermines efforts to reverse depopulation and it damages fragile island economies. Islanders waiting on new vessels on the Clyde and Hebridean routes, vessels that are already four years behind schedule and two and a half times over budget, deserve a profound and meaningful apology from this Government for their failures over the last 15 years. I welcome the Transport Minister De Grace to apologise for the disruption this winter. There has to be concerted action from the very top to put this right. There was a time when senior SNP politicians couldn't get themselves down to Port Glasgow quick enough to get their photo taken. Now they can't run away quick enough from the responsibility of this shambles. Willie Rennie and I both asked the Cabinet Secretary earlier if she would take, stake her position on the timely completion of these new vessels. She refused to do so on both occasions. Perhaps the Transport Minister will take responsibility instead. If not, it is clear that nobody, nobody in this Government is going to take responsibility. In fact, there has been a ministerial merry-go-round throughout this fiasco. We had Alex Salmon down there in 2014. Derek Mackay had his photo taken outside the, the yard. In 2017, Nicola Sturgeon launched a ferry with painted on windows that was still unfinished. Fiona Hislop fell out with the union. Michael Matheson, Humza and Graeme Day have all come and gone, unlike the boats. We have also had now, uh, last week, Ivan McKee was answering questions on this issue. Today, we have got Kate Forbes doing the statement, Jenny Goldfield doing the debate, the previous owners away. 
Uh, the turnaround director is away. The one constant presiding officer throughout this is the First Minister. And it's the First Minister who is ultimately accountable for the Scottish Government. And that is why today Scottish Labour are calling today for the First Minister to assume direct ministerial responsibility for the Government's investment in Ferguson's, because no one else is actually taking responsibility. Nicola Sturgeon needs to lead from the front, turn Ferguson's around and bring our Government's ferry fiasco to an end. That means the Glen Sachs fully operational with no more delays and followed by vessel 802. The completion of those vessels is essential to rebuilding confidence in Ferguson's and helping the yard bid for new work. And on the question of confidence in Ferguson's, let me say this. Today's Audit Scotland report will make difficult reading for many. Ultimate responsibility lies with the government, but there is plenty of blame to go around. There is no question, however, about the dedication and professionalism of the Ferguson's workforce. They have got on with the job as best they can in extremely difficult circumstances. They deserve better. They need to know the government is committed to completing these vessels. They need assurances that the new management setup will make the yard more competitive and bring new opportunities to the lower Clyde. So our appeal to the government is to complete these ferries and ensure the yard can bid for new work. That must include the opportunity to be part of a much needed ferry building and replacement programme. We need to build more ferries. Yet this, under this government since 2007, only six new ferries have been built in 15 years, compared to 10 new ferries uh, by the previous Labour and Liberal Democrat administration. A programme to rejuvenate an ageing fleet and ensure new ferries are built in Scotland. So I ask the Minister and Cabinet Secretary to consider the case for simpler, smaller models being built in the Clyde to help fill order books. The test for the future viability of Ferguson's should not be at the mercy of a vessel as complex to build as the Glen Sanex. I would also encourage the Government to engage with the GMB Union on the potential for new rural ferries to be built on the Clyde and deployed in the Calmac fleet. And I would say again that if concerns of the workforce have been addressed at an earlier point in this fiasco, then perhaps the delays and the overspends that have dogged this project could have been avoided. That underlines the need for the workforce and for islanders to be adequately represented in the governance of the ferry network. There should be an urgent review into the suitability of the current CMAL CalMAC model. It was designed in another time for another time. Finally, President Officer, I want to acknowledge that while today's Audit Scotland report usefully sets out the scale and nature of the failings at CalMAC, it did not answer all of our questions. It did not look into, into tender sorry, not CalMAC, Ferguson, sorry. Uh, it did not answer all of our questions. It did not look into tender documents or in any depth that the reported changes in procurement and design once construction had been approved. It was not able to interrogate in much greater depth the breakdown in the relationships between CMAL and Ferguson's. It was not able to establish whether it was reasonable to pay a turnaround director £2,783 per day. And it could have interrogated what the ministers knew and when, and why on earth they did not put in place normal financial safeguards. There is another way to get to those answers and ensure lessons are learned from this fiasco, and that is through a full public inquiry. There was a public inquiry for the Edinburgh trams because the costs doubled. Costs here are more than doubled. There will be no hiding from scrutiny in a full public inquiry. Key witnesses that did not appear before the Rural Economy and Connectivity Inquiry, people like Derek Mackay or the First Minister herself, and so Scottish Labour supports calls for an inquiry. Labour supported the decision to save Ferguson's yard from closure. We applaud the extraordinary effort that has gone into keeping Ferguson's open and keeping the workers in jobs. But in failing to oversee this project adequately, the government are failing those workers. There must be a better future for the workforce at Ferguson's, for the Lower Clyde and for our island communities. To unlock that future, we are calling on the First Minister to step in and turn this yard around and move the amendment in money. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Bibby. I now call on Willie, Re Willie Rennie for uh, up to six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. The ferry fiasco is a national embarrassment of the SNP's own making. Four years late, now, after today, five years late. Two and a half times the original budget, or even more. Painted on windows just for the First Minister. Cables too short, bulbous bow too small. Endless squabbling, and now a damning report from Audit Scotland. The embarrassment is never ending. But it's not just an embarrassment. It's a real world effect on islanders, on taxpayers, and on the workers at the shipyard. The effect on islanders is significant. Breakdowns and cancellations are commonplace. 
It's not a surprise, though, with the ageing ferry fleet, much of, well, of which was built on the Lower Clyde in the days of Margaret Thatcher. Who would have thought that Margaret Thatcher would have a better shipbuilding record than the SNP? But she did. But the delays today could have been avoided if the SNP had a proper ferry building plan to replace the ageing fleet, which they didn't. The delays almost every day could have been avoided if the SNP had built the ferries when promised five years ago, but they didn't. The repeated delays could have been avoided if they had managed to get the ferries built in 2018 or 2019 or 2020 or even 2021. All the dates for completion promised by the SNP but failed over and over again. Even now, the date has been delayed until next year. Not more delays and cancellations and breakdowns through another cold Scottish winter, I hear the islanders cry. One said the fiasco with procurement and the ageing fleet is going to get worse rather than better in the next number of years. It's horrendous. But those waiting on the new ferry for Arran will just need to wait longer. And those waiting on the new ferry to Skye will need to wait even longer. The Sky Boat song would never have been quite the same without the boat. The delays are long and tortuous, but the costs have shot through the roof. Patients, children and the homeless will just have to watch as the Scottish Government spends ever greater sums of money on two ferries that are still not complete. The costs have rocketed from 97 to 240 million and possibly to an estimated 400 million, four times the original price. So let's put that in context. That's seven high schools for children desperately waiting to move from their damp ridden buildings. It's 2,000 council houses for those desperate for a home, but it buys just one new children's hospital in Edinburgh. But that's another story. The SNP seem to think it's OK for all of those people to wait and watch the SNP bungle contracts for building ships on the Clyde. It's got so embarrassing for the SNP that they even refuse to be interviewed by the BBC about it. But that's nothing compared with the embarrassment that they feel now the SNP-owned ferry company doesn't even bid for its own ferries. Those ferries will be built by Turkish yards, benefiting Turkish workers, Turkish taxpayers and Turkish communities. I've heard some say the new slogan should be SNP stronger for Turkey. It's got so desperate and embarrassing the SNP are reaching for Boris Johnson's playbook on building bridges. They want to build one to Mull now. If the Minister's listening, she should get on the building fits links in Shetland, which does want them, rather than Mull that doesn't. But all of this is a prime example of a failed SNP industrial intervention strategy. It intervened with Bifab before the company collapsed. It exposed to the tune of hundreds of millions of pounds at the Lochaber Smelter, and the 2,000 jobs are nowhere to be seen. They have spent millions on Presswick, but still can't sell it. They are potentially exposed to millions of pounds for the environmental clean-up at the Lanarkshire steel mills, and they seem incapable of handling relationships with business. Duped by the £10 billion Chinese deal that never was, Try to renege on a deal with Tata over the clean-up costs, and now not able, not even able, to train enough workers to build just eight wind farm jackets in Fife. The SNP's record on ferry building is just one example of a series of industrial-sized failures. It's the workers, the taxpayers, the islanders who will lose out. What we need is a new plan for ferry construction. New investment to replace the ageing fleet. A turnaround plan that works for Ferguson's. A government that delivers on its promises. And a public inquiry into this utter shambles. But I suspect, like everybody else, 
we will be kept waiting for ever longer before we get any of these things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. Uh, we now move to the open debate. I call first Edward Mountain to be followed by Jackie Dunbar for uh, up to seven minutes, please, Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And yet again, we're discussing the inabilities of this incompetent Scottish Government to keep our islands connected. Four years ago, we needed to build one ferry every year to keep our fleet fit for purpose. Now, according to CalMac, because of the government's failings, we need to build two and a half ferries every year for the next 10 years to get back on track. That's a sad indictment. Presiding officer, seven years ago, a contract was awarded to build two ferries, and today it appears neither of them are close to completion. I need to remind you, presiding officer, that it took seven years to build an aircraft carrier. And yet this government has nothing to show for the hundreds of millions of pounds that we have spent. What a farce. So what went wrong? Things started to go wrong even before the contract was awarded. If we cast our back, minds back to 2014, the year of the divisive but definitive referendum, in August of that year, the Ferguson Yard went into receivership. Not good news for Scotland or the case for independence. Resolving the issue became a priority for the government and for Alex Salmon. Oh, how fortuitous it was that within a month and before the referendum, a key SNP financial supporter and their economic adviser stepped up and purchased the yard. Coincidence, surely, and not as some have suggested, on the back of a promise that the yard would be awarded some government ferry contracts. Perish that thought. But barely a year later, Ferguson Marine Engineering, the new name of the yard, had indeed been awarded the contract. And let me list some of the attributes of the yards that were, were identified at the time of their tender. They had a highly skilled workforce, no doubt, but they had no management experience of shipbuilding. None of the managers had been near a boat. It was the most expensive tender. It had the most unrealistic delivery time. The company couldn't prove any evidence of financial security. And the company didn't even have the support of the purchaser, Seamal. Bearing that in mind, of course, why wouldn't you give them the contract? So next we need to look at how the Scottish Government managed this contract. As Willie Rennie has said, there are numerous SNP ministers who have played past the parcel with this hot potato, and they've all had their fingers burned. There was Nicola Sturgeon, who had a hotline to Monaco and the owner, and launched Hull 801 in 2017 with wooden windows and funnels connected to engines that weren't actually there. Of course, there was Hamza Youssef, the Minister of Transport, who couldn't even explain why there was a delay to the ferries when we passed the construction date. There was Derek Mackay, who signed off the payments of £127 million of a £97 million contract to Ferguson Marine to only end up with two rusting hulls. And there was Michael Matheson, as Cabinet Secretary for Transport, who assured everyone, till almost he'd left the appointment, that everything was going, wrong, uh, going right and there was nothing wrong. And Kate Forbes, I'm glad you're back. You oversaw the yard palming off control to a turnaround director who saw no turnaround of the yard's fortunes. There was Fiona Hislop, who claimed that the shipyard had a bright future ahead of it, but had no knowledge of the depth of the problems. And there was Graham Day, who knew of the problems and who was content, content for a shipyard in Turkey to build the next ferry. And now it falls to Jenny Gilruth, who, after five weeks of being asked when the ferries would be delivered, was unable to confirm it, leaving it to Kate Forbes to do so today. That's a pretty dis disappointing role of honour. Frankly, it is a role of shame, and each and every one of them should hold their heads in shame and embarrassment. So who was this turnaround director that was appointed by the Finance Secretary? Well, he was appointed after a single telephone interview. He came with, of course, the relevant shipbuilding experience, having been a cruise ship engineer 30 years ago. And the previous company he turned around went into liquidation shortly after he left it. Now, business ex experience tells me that the first six months of a turnaround director's appointment, they are part of the problem. And after that, they become the problem. For nearly two years, the yard struggled on rearranging the stores, rearranging the yard layout. And some people have said to me it was about as useful as reorganising the chairs on the Titanic after it had hit the iceberg. And finally, presiding officer, I want to mention costs. Apparently, this was a fixed-price contract. 
with 15 stage payments for each ferry. Someone therefore needs to explain to me and the islanders how this government allowed the pa payment of 82% of the contract value before the ferries were even completed. That was how much they had paid when the yard went into rece receivership. But it doesn't stop there. This government, without the knowledge of CMAL, went and lent FMEL £45 million, pounds, not even telling CMAL that they'd lent that, that money when CMAL was still signing off payments before they went to the government. And they also swept under the carpet, and they have done today on every single opportunity, the additional harbour infrastructure costs to allow these new ferries to run. We haven't even considered how much has been spent in each harbour to allow the ferries to come in, the cost of the LNG tanks. In fact, the LNG tank is an interesting thing because we commission ferries where we don't have any LNG, so the LNG has to come up from Kent in a, in a lorry to be delivered up to the ferries so that they can run. I'm sure that's really good green uh, policies there. So when this all comes down to the end of it, we've heard today that I think, I've, unless I've got this wrong, there's about another 140 million on the ferries. We've already spent 140 million. My reckon, my belief is that we probably spent 100 million by the time we've done all of the infrastructure. And I think we will have little change from half a billion pounds. And if we open the books and we look at the true costs at all stages, we'll find out. So, presiding officer, I know the Auditor General has been quoted, and I'm going to quote him again. The failure to deliver these two ferries on time and on budget exposes a multitude of failings, a lack of transparent decision making, a lack of project oversight, and near, no clear understanding of the significant sums of public money and what they've achieved. And crucially, communities still don't have the lifeline ferry services they were promised years and years ago. This is, presiding officer, a complete mess. It is a complete demonstration of catastrophic mismanagement, as the REC committee pointed out in 2021. And what we really need is a public inquiry. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Mountain. I now call on Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Jamie Green for up to six minutes, Ms Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate on Scotland's ferries. Although I was not an MSP at the time, I am acutely aware of the extensive inquiry that the Rural Committee undertook on ferries in Session 5. I am sure we are all in agreement that it is incredibly crucial to our island communities and indeed island economies that we have good transport links between our remote communities and the mainland. These transport links act as an essential lifeline for residents, including for the supply of food and services. Over the last few years, Scotland's ferries have been operating in very tough conditions. Ferries have faced the challenges of the COVID-19 restrictions, combined with increasingly more adverse weather events. Vessels also need to be taken out of circulation for essential day-to-day -day maintenance, which folk in this chamber seem to forget about at times. And these challenges have caused cancellations and disruptions on the ferry network. In response to these challenges, the SNP Scottish Government has invested over £1.9 billion in our ferry services vessels and infrastructure since taken office in 2007. These investments have included new routes, new vessels, upgraded harbour infrastructure, as well as the rollout of significantly reduced fares through the road equivalent tariff scheme. I yeah, will take an intervention if I have got time, President Officer. Okay. Neil Bibby. Um, the, 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 thank you for taking the intervention. You mentioned the, the, the level of investment that the government made in ferries since 2007, but you've only, the government has only built six ferries in 15 years. That is not nearly good enough, particularly when you compare it to the last Labour and Liberal Democrat administration that built 10 in those eight years. So clearly the government isn't, you know, the rhetoric isn't matching the reality of what people in Scotland need. Jackie de Bar, I can give you the time back. Th uh, thank you, President Officer. And I hear what Mr Bibby is saying, but um, we have put the budgets in place, and sometimes the budget outweigh uh, that in place is more important than what the, the what is uh, what is delivered. Uh, that doesn't really make much sense, President Officer. Um, what I was meaning was sometimes um, it's good to have the in to, to have the budgets in place and and the responsibility within the Scottish Government. Um, 
Presiding officer, eight new vessels have been introduced to the Kalmak fleet since 2007, as Mr Bibby has said, including a further two in construction, highlighting the, the SNP Scottish Government's commitment to crucial infrastructure for our island communities. Our Scottish Government has delivered significant ferry fare reductions to the Clyde and Hebrides, leading to a welcome boost in carryings which supports our island and remote communities and their local economies. This was emphasised by the Scottish Government budget, which continues to provide support for subsidised ferry services across the islands, with £19.2 million for local authority ferries, which was an increase of £7.7 .7 million on the previous year. This demonstrates the commitment the Scottish Government puts on our islands. I don't know who was first presiding officer. I think it was Ms Clark. Katie Clark. Um, for allowing me to um, ask... I mean, is she aware that in the 14 years up till 2007, 26 ferries were brought into service? And does she not accept that that compares very poorly um, with the 14 years since 2007? And the long-term the, the long failure to invest from 2007 is really the reason we're here today. Jackie Dunbar. Debate. Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. I am aware of the 46 per cent capital cut that Labour and the Liberal Democrats did in their time that they were in government. Given that the investments and actions I have laid out, it is simply puzzling that we continually hear from across the chamber calls for more funding for everything, from transport infrastructure to healthcare to justice to education. The list is never ending. Yet I am still waiting to see what any of the opposition parties' budgets would have been. I have see, not seen sight nor sound of where they would cut funding from to fund their endless calls for money. It is very easy to demand when you don't have to balance the books every year. Perhaps if the opposition joined our calls for full fiscal autonomy for this parliament, they would at least have a basis for their uncosted financial demands. Coming from a local authority setting, when most opposition parties, and I say most, provide an alternative budget, I was amazed that none came forward in this chamber. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to undertaking the first ever comprehensive review of the ferry network. The island's con connectivity plan will replace the current ferries plan and look at aviation ferries and fixed links to ensure all potential options for connecting our island communities are considered. As part of this plan, it is key that the Scottish Government consult with users of the ferries and learn from the experiences of other countries and other modes of transport. And I ask the Minister for an insurance on this. And I welcome that the Scottish Government will produce and maintain a long-term plan and investment programme for new ferries and development of ports to improve resilience, reliability, capacity and accessibility, and increase standardisation and reduce emissions to meet the needs of island communities. Presiding officer, in 2005, when the Ferguson's Yard faced closure because of the inaction of the previous Labour government, the SNP joined with Labour rebels to demand the yard was saved. Then in 2014, when the yard faced closure once more, it was the SNP Scottish Government that stepped up and helped save it, rescuing more than 300 jobs. Today, there is now almost 500 permanent and temporary staff at Ferguson's. Let's contrast that against the recent developments with P&O Ferries, a multi-million corporation which benefited from taxpayer COVID-19 funding and which has just made 800 staff redundant with absolutely no notice. I absolutely have got no time, Mr Kerr. Normally, you, you do know need I would. to be wi winding the, up now. The Come services up. provided by P&O, including the vital links between Scotland, Northern Ireland and Europe through the port of Cairn Ryan, are essential for Scotland's economy. Yet the Tory UK government have cons consistently blocked changes to employment leg legislation that would have prevented the abhorrent treatment of workers at Piano Ferries, and they still no show no signs of doing anything to close down the possibilities of future companies doing the you same. You do need to conclude, Ms Dunbar. Will, I'll conclude, uh, presiding officer. Will the Labour join me today in supporting the Scottish Government, which shows clear support 
for P&O Ferries employees and calls for the fire and rehire practices to be outlawed. Okay, thank you very much, Mr Barn. I now call Jamie Green to be followed by Katie Clark. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Apologies, technical issues. Um, first of all, I want to say that I was really pleased to be taking part in today's debate. And I want to thank Finlay, my office, for stepping up uh, this week in the most difficult of circumstances. But also because I've been raising the issue of ferries pretty much since I stood for election, both in my regional capacity, but also when I held the transport brief and as a member of the previous uh, REC committee. This debate really is for them, our islanders. This is the chance to give them that much needed voice in all of this, because barely a week goes by when there isn't some sort of ferry related fiasco and on our beleaguered ferry network. And MSPs representing any island community will know at first hand the constant delays and cancellations that have just become a regular and routine part of islanders' day-to-day -day lives. And these are not all weather related either. And specifically, I would say to those sitting behind the government benches, who often are sitting there sheepishly asking their pre-scripted questions about ferries, pointing the finger at everyone but their own ministers, and all the while pretending to be angry in the local papers, but who are afraid to come into this chamber and hold their own ministers to account for a change. Uh, happily. Cabinet Secretary. I'm wondering if the member would recognise that the ministers that he's referring to also represent island communities that are also dependent on these vessels. Jamie Green. I, oh, absolutely, you represent those communities and you should be ashamed of the way your government is treating them. So also, uh, in the last few uh, weeks alone, perfect examples of what this means on the ground for our islanders. The 16-year-old MV Loch Shira has been out of action because of numerous sewage system problems. Multiple routes are out of operation because the temporary replacement vessels are unable to handle the strong winds that the scheduled vessel could have. And it's this constant moving of the jigsaw, moving pieces around, vessels from one route to another, is actually competing in pitting island against island, which is annoying islanders the most. And of course, the biggest kick in the teeth, the biggest kick in the teeth is handing ferry contracts to Turkey. You know, and I think this is the inevitable and sad outcome of the nationalisation of a Clyde shipbuilder. I'd say to uh, Willie Rennie, stronger for Turkey isn't just a silly meme. It's a sad truth, unfortunately. It's a sad truth of the inevitable result of this government. I know what Mr Millen is going to ask me. I'm going to come on to the nationalisation issue in one second. So listen up. The story of this government mismanagement, the story of this government's mismanagement goes back a way. No, please do listen, because I'm very happy. I'm very happy to address uh, the utter catastrophic nationalisation project that you've embarked on in just Mr. One Green, through the chair, please. Hmm? Through the chair, Through please, Mr. Happily, Green. Uh, happily, presiding officer. The 2007 SNP manifesto promised a fairer deal for Ireland. That was an admirable promise to make to the electorate. In 2011, it repeated that promise by saying, we have placed the needs and aspirations of our island communities at the very centre of our government's agenda. Is that so? Is that so? So where on earth is the new ferry for Aaron? Then, which bit of that single failure alone has putting Ireland at the heart of our government's agenda? You know, the First Minister herself, back in 2015, said, "We are committed to supporting ferry users right across Scotland by providing safe and reliable services. We will ensure we have a fleet that continues to deliver for the communities that depend on it." Well, First Minister, we're still waiting on that fleet. Two years later, she said she made another visit to Ferguson and said, "This one, of course." the famous one that is going down in history, the much-heralded launch of the Glen Sanox, a ship with no pipework, no electrics, no engine, and those infamous painted-on windows that I think have come to symbolise this government's approach to our island communities. Mm -hmm. All shiny and appealing on the outside, but not fit for purpose when you peer through the painted-on portholes. All we've heard is countless manifesto promises, countless programmes for government, and not a single head has rolled, no one has been fined, no one has been investigated, no one has been really held to account. And of course I welcome the apology today from the Transport Ministers, but all the while Transport Minister Islands are suffering on a day-to-day -day basis. I have raised issues about ferry-related problems no fewer than 85 times in this chamber alone, including even in my maiden speech. One of the first anecdotes I shared to the chamber was about a gentleman from Arran with a physical disability who couldn't schedule a hospital appointment on the mainland. That was six years ago. 
And since then, dozens and dozens of cases have been taken on by my office, by the offices of my colleagues, and probably by every member in this chamber. Problems with accessing health care, education, tourism, businesses, agriculture. You know, I could share a whole afternoon of stories and anecdotes of people being let down by a litany of technical cancellations and delays on their ferries. Graham Simpson spoke about a constituent of mine. She missed a breast cancer operation not that long ago. That's not just a shame. That is negligence, I would say. And that wasn't COVID's fault either. It wasn't Jim McCall's fault. It wasn't Tim Hare's fault. It wasn't even Robbie Drummond's fault. It's the whole broken system's fault. A system of ferry tenders, which are so narrowly specced, they prohibit sensible competition on profitable routes. Of a ferry operating company who doesn't own the ferries that it operates, which isn't given the ferries that it asks for. Of vessels which don't match the ports that they're supposed to serve. Of putting cruise liner services on short-range commuter routes. Of failing to listen to the needs of communities. Of complex ownership and operating structures. Of a lack of oversight. Of zero accountability when it comes to millions and millions of pounds of public money. And let's sprinkle on top a gross and long-standing failure to come up with any sort of shipbuilding or procurement plan which is fit for purpose or delivers value for money. And scratch below the surface, everyone knows that CalMac is at creaking point. They know it. CalMac know it. CMAL know it. Transport Scotland knows it. And even the government knows it. And let's go to that point of nationalisation. Because we hear it so many times, they saved the yard. Well, let me ask then, if you save the yard, let me ask some very specific questions. Did Jim McCall or not ask or offer to siphon off the CMAL contract into a separate company that the government could easily have taken ownership, allowing the yard to prosper free from the shackles of the plagued LNG project? Or was he lying? Or was his offer rejected? And if it was rejected, why? Who else put a bid in for the yard? How many bids were received? And why were they rejected? Did the government threaten potential new, owner, new owners of the yard with the burden of calling in its debt? And who on earth did the risk analysis on any of this and what the effect of public ownership would have on the yard about state aid or its ability to tender for new contracts? Where are those new contracts? Which bit of saving the yard has resulted in Scotland building ships in Turkey? At least Scotland's other government gets on with actually building ships in Scotland. This government should be ashamed and I support the motion in Graham's name. Thank you very much, Mr Green. I now call Katie Clark to be followed by Paul McLennan to up to six minutes, Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome this debate and also the tone of the Cabinet Secretary's opening remarks, which seem to accept that islanders have been let down. Islanders on Arran and Cumbria contact me on an almost daily basis about ferry cancellations. They fully appreciate the problems caused by weather and by COVID, which is still with us. But they get in touch about issues connected with mechanical and technical failures, which are impacting on their lives and the lives of everyone in their community. This debate is about the failure to deliver a resilient ferry fleet. In the time available to me, I want to focus on the long-term failure to invest in the new fleet on CalMac routes, the lack of an industrial strategy or procurement framework to ensure that we have the capacity to build new fleet in Scotland and the wider issues on, of employment rights in the maritime sector, which Jackie Dunbar referred to and have been highlighted again by the treatment of P&O workers. Most industry experts agree that the average life expectancy of a ferry is 25 years. Half of the 31 working state-owned ferries are older than that. The Caledonia Isles on the Adrosan to Brodick route was brought into service in 1993. The Loch Ridden on Largs to Cumbria route in 1986. And the Isle of Arran, which is used on the Adrosan to Campbelltown and Adrosan to Arran routes in 1983. More than a thousand ferry sailings have been delayed over the last five years due to mechanical issues which are associated with the age of the fleet. And the failure to invest it consistently since 2007 is part of the reason that we are in this position. We heard the statement earlier on on Ferguson Marine, and I think it's important that we put on record that it is not the fault of the workforce that we're in this position today, but this mistakes and mismanagement by politicians and by management. 
We need to rebuild the reputation of the yard and to ensure a pipeline of future ferry contracts which can be achieved. And we need to learn, the mis learn from the mistakes which have been made up to now. The Scottish Government has wasted over half a million pounds in taxpayer money to private firm Ernst & Young to provide advice since, since 2015. We have already heard that senior management have been paid eye-watering sums. We need an emergency ferry plan with a procurement strategy to ensure that our ferries are built in Scotland, but also groups like the Arran Ferry Action Group and islanders in the communities affected are involved in decision making. Frankly, if they had been more involved in the decision making that led to this debate today, we would not be having the kind of contributions from members on all sides of the House. The trade unions also need to be um, involved in these discussions. Um, and I asked um, the Cabinet Secretary uh, yesterday um, if they could be involved in discussions around about P&O. But what I would say is that it's vital that trade unions and the workforce in Calmac, in Seamal, um, but also in Ferguson Marine are involved in these discussions. The Scottish Government needs to accept that mistakes have been made. They need to stop digging. They need to accept that there was an investment in the levels that were required since 2007 and therefore further investment is needed to catch up. We need to start including communities in decision making and that includes in agreeing to a public inquiry to ensure that lessons are learnt for the future. The backdrop of course is a marine sector. Um, which is not fully covered by employment law, which is the reason why we're seeing um, workforces brought in that are paid less than the, um, the national minimum wage um, due to the exemption of seafarers um, from uh, all employment law regulations. Um, that's part of the reason why it's important um, that the ferries are kept um, in the public sector. Um, but that's also why it's important that Ferguson Marine, CalMAT in the public sector um, and the other parts of the, the um, sector that are owned by the public are successful. Um, so I assure um, the Scottish Government that they have the support of Scottish Labour in keeping um, these services in public ownership. Um, but we genuinely believe that the government needs to listen to what communities, what the workforce and all involved are saying to learn lessons, to agree to a public inquiry so that we do not repeat the mistakes that have been made in the past. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Clark. I now call on Paul McLennan to be followed by Ariane Burgess uh, for around six minutes. Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. In this debate this afternoon, we can all agree that ferry services provide an essential lifeline to island and remote rural communities and their economies, as we have heard today. I am aware how important this is to the communities they serve and what it means to the economy and general well-being of such communities. Changing climate and the many storms this year alongside COVID-19 has caused many cancellations in ferry services, and I appreciate the apologies from the Transport Minister this afternoon on that. Now, I want to touch on the Audit Scotland report before we go any further in the discussions as well. The Audit Scotland report there is, is really, like any report, is looking back but also recommending on ways ahead. And I want to just touch on the point that both the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Transport Minister have touched on as well. Mentioned that it says our recommendations are intended to support the completion of vessels 801 and 802. That has been picked up. Improve future procurement, contract management and delivery of new vessels. That has been picked up. Help inform thinking about the future of MP MPG. That has been picked up and increase the transparency of the Scottish Government's decisions and expected outcomes in relation to supporting private business. Part of the debate today, of course, is looking back, but it is learning lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen Kerr. I can get the time back, if that is OK. Yeah. Stephen Kerr. Paul McLennan lists recommendations, but does he also acknowledge that Audit Scotland's report says there, are, there remain significant and unsolved problems relating to the projects? Does he accept that? Paul McLennan. Yeah, and I think that's been, just as I said, I think it's looking back and also looking forward. And I think these points have already been picked up by the Cabinet Secretary and the Transport Minister. Now, we have to acknowledge that trans technical issues have also caused further, further issues. And this obviously adds to people's frustrations and inconvenience. It's also worth as a balance acknowledging that over £2 billion has been invested in service contracts, new vessels and infrastructure since 2007. And in that, in the current five-year period, a further £508 million has been committed. 
And it's a good point that Jackie Dunbar mentioned earlier on. We have no alternative funding proposals from the opposition parties. None. Now, this £580 million will enable harbour investments, two new vessels for Islet to be built, and of course the purchase MB Lock visa we heard earlier on. Yeah, I'm trying to balance the time, President Officer. But... I can give you a little bit of time back. Okay. Liam Kerr. Very, very grateful. Briefly. Does the member think it serves the Oban to Mull route well to replace the current vessel with a second hand vessel which is slower and with one third of the capacity? Paul McLennan. I think that's a decision for, for people who have got expertise in, in that sector. I don't pretend to have the expertise in that, in, in that particular project. I'm more than happy to take that up with you. So, the Scottish Government commitment to publish the Islands Connectivity Plan by the end of 22, uh, 2022 is also very welcome, and I have no doubt will be discussed in this place and in committee, and, and quite rightly it needs to be. As we know, the Islands Connectivity Plan will replace the current ferries plan, looking at aviation, ferries, fixed length, and invest in more sustainable ferries, and ensure 30 per cent of state-owned ferries are low emission by 2032. The Island Connectivity Plan will also take forward through the National Strategic uh, Strategy and the Strategic Transport Projects Review. Now, this will enable us to look at other potential viable options connecting the, uh, the islands that we have heard. The Islands Connectivity Plan will replace the Ferries Plan by the end of 20 2022, and engagement and consultation on this will enable substantial public and community input. We have heard that important, just a point that Katie Clark mentioned, there obviously needs to be input from the communities. This must be extensive and allow two-way conversations. And perhaps the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary can comment on that in the summing up. I think that's incredibly important. We need to invest in more sustainable ferries, reducing the carbon footprint, as I said, by 30%, to 30 per cent of state-owned ferries by 2032. Now, the Scottish Government also plans to ex explore the potential to build more fixed links to island and rural communities, such as the potential from a bridge from Gurek to Dunoon, and work with island communities to reduce reliance on ferries. Again, this needs to be part of the consultation process. Investment at a ferry fleet can come from as the benefits for our industry. The Scottish Government's intervention in 2019 saved the Ferguson Yard and its workforce in an uncertain future. We can't underestimate that. Progress has been made at Yard, but we need to ensure Fergus, uh, Ferguson Marine is back to being a serious contender for future vessel contracts. Yeah, um, I'm not going to be able to give you any right, more time I'm back. Sorry, Mr Sweeney, I've taken a few already. However, we must ensure delivery as best we can when it comes to lifeline services for our island communities. Ferguson Marine continues to evolve with the appointment of the new C uh, CEO earlier this year has been touched on. The Scottish Government remains fully committed to supporting the Ferguson Yard to secure a sustainable future, including a pipeline of future work. Of course, it was disappointing that Ferguson Marine did not progress to the invitation to tender stage of the Daily Vessel last year. The Scottish Government, as Cabinet Secretary has said, continues to work closely with the Yard to ensure that it becomes globally competitive. But let's remember the Ferguson Yard is still operating, employing hundreds of skilled workers. The decision taken to safeguard the future of Ferguson Marine was the right one. Not only did it, 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 our efforts save the last commercial shipyard in the Clyde from closure, it directly saved more than 300 jobs. I have not got time. I think it has been mentioned by the, the uh, presiding officer. Sorry. The Scottish Government has set out two, uh, two priorities for the yard's management. To finish building the two ferries that are under construction and get the yard back into the shape to complete for new work. And of course, Scottish Government ministers will do all they can to ensure a strong, uh, strong future for, Fergus, uh, for Ferguson. Now, it has also been mentioned about the review of the legal structures and governance arrangements which exist, uh, exist between the tripartite group, that is Transport Scotland, CMAL and CalMAC, and that is incredibly important, and it remains fit for purpose to deliver an effective, efficient and economic ferry services, which started and will deliver a final report later this year. The Scottish Government is also developing an advised ferry stakeholder engagement strategy, and again, I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary or Minister can maybe pick up on that um, at the end when they're summing up. The strategy will set an approach to engagement in three uh, key areas operational issues, strategy, and policy. The infrastructure investment plan we've heard for 21 to 2026 will produce and maintain a long term and investment programme for new ferries and development at ports to improve resilience, reliability, capacity, accessibility, and reduce emissions to meet the needs of island communities. But in, office, in conclusion, it's been a tough few years for some of our island communities, adverse May weather, COVID and of course technical and delayed orders. Lessons do need to be learned. Our island communities need to be reassured. They need to be fully consulted and we need to have a thriving shipbuilding industry in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. Uh, I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Kenneth Gibson for uh, up to six minutes, Ms Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As we have heard across, from across the Chamber, ferries are vital arteries of our island communities. Cancelled ferry is a first baby scan missed, a shop or pharmacy unstocked. The accumulation of these disruptions can no longer be 
the accumulation of these disruptions can reach a tipping point where island life is sadly no longer viable. There is no doubt that this has been a challenging winter for island residents, businesses and communities. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I feel viscerally the impact that ferry disruption has on my constituents. It is absolutely vital to put them at the centre of this debate. Earlier this month, three families with young children left South Uist in just one week after the latest in a long string of incidents leading to cancellations of the Loch Boisdale Ferry. Only 24% of respondents to the National Islands Plan survey feel that young people are sufficiently supported and encouraged to re remain, move or return to islands. We can change this by improving transport links and connectivity. These lifeline services are essential to community life, so it's only responsible that the governance of them should include members of the communities that they serve. A positive step would be for the Scottish Government to implement mandatory islander representatives on the boards which provide oversight of Scotland's ferries. It should not be lost in this debate that the ferries are not separate from our communities. They are our community communities. Water-based passenger transport provides around 1,100 jobs, mainly in island and coastal areas. And I join the Scottish Government in recognising the work done by vessel masters in ensuring the safety of crews and passengers. The Scottish Green Party strongly supports ferry workers' rights and joins the Scottish Government in condemning the despicable employment practices recently deployed by p and ferries. I would further note that it is imperative that the UK Government take swift action to close the legal loopholes that made this possible. COVID-19 could not have been predicted, but the absences and disruption should now be factored into business planning. This may require extra resources, and we would support the Scottish Government to take action to increase resilience in staffing. Similarly, the climate emergency has meant that extreme weather events are becoming the new normal. The recent spate of severe storms has shown just how disruptive that can be to transport as well as to internet and electricity connections. We need to take action now to make plans to adapt to these changes so that islanders are not left on the sharp end of them. How can we move forward? I would echo calls from my constituents. I echo calls from my constituents and local councillors to expand the current fleet, which would build in redundancy over the winter and add capacity in the summer, and welcome the Minister's comment that this work is underway. Yes, rapid change. Yeah. Graham Simpson. Thank Arian Burgess for taking the intervention. Um, would she uh, agree with me, therefore, that we need to increase the budget? For, a fer for ferry replacements in order to get more ferries. Ariane Burgess, I can give you that time back. Thank you, Mr Simpson. Rapid change needs to be made, but we must get this right, and that means taking time to properly define the requirements and identify the benefits, as well as increasing investment. Whilst I welcome the investments made in service contracts, new vessels and infrastructure, and the further £580 million which has been committed over the next five years, I would urge that new vessels be zero or low carbon. Electric ferries are already running on renewable energy in New Zealand and Denmark, in Sweden and Denmark, and Europe's first green hydrogen ferry is currently being designed here in Scotland. We may also need to increase the use of diesel-electric hybrid ferries until we can phase out diesel completely. Retrofitting. Jimmy Hawker Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. I um, thank Karen Burgess for taking the intervention as well. Um, given that the number of um, low emission ferries has actually gone backwards in the last few years because of the purchase of the Northern Ireland's boats, and there are all those issues with regard to the replacement ferries, does Arian Burgess support our calls for a public inquiry into uh, this government's mismanagement of our ferry network? Arian Burgess. Thank you. I find it disappointing that the member wants to turn this, point into a point score, this debate into a point-scoring blame game. Our communities need us to work constructively to provide the best lifeline services we can, and that is a Greens approach. Retrofitting an electric motor to a diesel ferry is win-win. It, it cuts pollution, emissions, noise and running costs. I was pleased to see on a recent trip to Orkney the work that Northlink Ferries and Orkney Island Council have undertaken to reduce emissions through the use of onshore electricity connectors. 
Installing electric vehicle charge points on ferries would enable drivers to charge their ferries en route, reduce, reduce range anxiety and increase the use of electric vehicles on the islands, both by residents and tourists. Sweden's Ropax ferries already have EV charge points. These can be retrofitted on our current vessels. To upgrade and decarbonise the fleet, we need a strategic long-term plan, but this is challenging when the publicly owned operator CalMac has to bid for the contract every six years at great expense. It would help to end the competitive bidding process, making inter-island ferries part of a publicly owned Scottish national infrastructure. Fixed links are another important element of our transport mix and could provide cost-effective long-term solutions to island communities, such as Yell and Unst in Shetland, where there is strong support for this. I stand firmly with our island communities, ready to listen and incorporate their lived experience into our future work on the island's connectivity plan, the resource spending review and the second, the, the, the second strategic transport project. I will be working hard with the Scottish Government to deliver a robust ferry network that will help reverse depopulation and ensure a future where our island communities can flourish and thrive. Thank you, Ms Burgess. I now call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by uh, Stuart McMillan for up to six minutes, please, Mr Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When it comes to the procurement and construction of new lifeline ferries, the Glen Sanox and 802, it is important to deliver the vessels and Ultimately, the service our constituents both need and deserve. As a local member for two island communities, I am in Cumbria. I can say that the sheer number of ferry-related emails and phone calls received in recent months and years, even at the height of the coronavirus pandemic, reflects the increasingly poor and unreliable service islands have had to put up with, put up with for far too long. Roughly 40 per cent of sailings to and from Brodick this year have been cancelled, mostly but not only due to inclement weather. This is a totally unacceptable uh, and, of course, island constituents and businesses are understandably at the end of their tether. It is simply undeniable that island communities have been severely affected by the repeated delays in the spiralling cost of delivering a reliable Clyde and Hebridean ferry fleet. Most island constituents appreciate that a sustained and prolonged period of severe weather, as well as COVID outbreaks among crews, have caused severe disruption to Arne and Cumbria's lifeline ferry services and, indeed, others across the network. However, they also know that there have been serious project management fails in relation to construction of the Glen Sanox, which was originally due to be delivered in 2018 to operate on the Adros and Brodick route, a vessel which is absolutely key to improving Ireland's ferry services. And many islanders now wonder if this ship will ever go into service. And I was pleased, therefore, to have reassurances and, indeed, a very determined statement from the Cabinet Secretary that this will indeed uh, happen. The recent announcement regarding a further delay in the delivery of this long overdue vessel, though, due to issues with legacy cables installed prior to the shipyard going into administration in August 2019 and damage to the hull after Glen Sanex recently slipped its moorings, requiring a repair in December of this year, adds insult to injury for Arne residents and businesses. Audit Scotland's report provides a timeline detailing a plethora of missteps which ultimately led to the failure to deliver the two vessels on time and on budget. Of course, hindsight is always in 2020 vision. Let us not forget that at the time the contract was won by Fergus Marine Engineering Limited in Port Glasgow, there were few, if any, objections and much celebration that this could and would revitalise the yard. Luke Van Beek, former independent shipbuilding advisor to the Scottish Government, said he was in no doubt that Ferguson Marine had the management expertise and, having rebuilt the yard, had a good shipbuilding system in place. Indeed, pioneering Diesel-electric hybrid ferries, MV Lochinva and MV Halleg, had just been delivered by the shipyard on time and on budget to be followed soon after by the MV Katrina, now serving Lochranza from Arran. Mr Mountain. Edward hey, Mountain. Uh, member for taking an intervention. Does, does the member accept that CMAL, the, the company that was charged with overseeing this contract, was distinctly unhappy with the contract being awarded and, in fact, in August of the year, that the contract was awarded, that's a month before it was awarded, they were also they were voicing their concerns that the company was capable, the management of the company was capable of undertaking the job. Kenneth Gibson. For your comment, I have to say, however, that the overwhelming view at the time, uh, certainly from within this chamber and beyond it, was on balance that the right contract was awarded to the right yard at the right time. And that was certainly the view, as I recall, uh, being a member at that time. 
Of course, we must not forget that the Scottish Government's subsequent actions to protect the shipyard from closure protected hundreds of skilled jobs in one of Scotland's most deprived communities, a step criticised by some opposition politicians, including Jamie, J including Jamie Green, who were apparently happy to see Ferguson's close. And he said, and I quote, at the time, 2nd of September 2019, Jamie, no one in their right mind thinks nationalisation is the answer to the Ferguson fiasco. However, having assessed the Scottish Government's and three additional bids, Deloitte concluded that the former represented the best return for creditors. It has since become clear that Ferguson's has yet to prove itself able to deliver large vessels on time, budget and to tender criteria. It is therefore my firm belief that the Scottish Government was right when it recently awarded the contract to build two new Calmac ferries to a Turkish shipbuilder. That notwithstanding, FMEL has proved it can deliver smaller vessels on time, on budget and to high standard. I therefore believe that small vessel procurement should and will be funnelled through FMEL and that continued success in building small ships will build, in turn, confidence and expertise, enabling future bids for larger vessels. Delivery of the Scottish Government's small vessel replacement programme will be absolutely crucial to improving the largest Cumbria service in my constituency, and I would like to renew my calls for the small vessel replacement programme to be expedited, given the high number of breakdowns with older vessels on the route. And earlier this month, a rope and sea kelp lodged in MV Lochshira's propeller blade, which meant it had to be removed from service, with substantial repairs required uh, in dry dock. Relief vessels were unavailable due to outstanding technical faults, resulting in many people being stranded in Largs and on Cumbria for 21 hours. Now, besides Ferguson Marine's more obvious project management shortcomings, other decision-making actors cannot be exempted from criticism, including Transport Scotland, whose actions have at times been characterised by poor decision-making and excessive tolerance of risk and a lack of transparency and accountability. So where does this leave us? First of all, the shipyard's new chief executive, David Tideman, must deliver the Glen Sanex and 802 and develop the yard so it will once again be able to compete. And I welcome all the reports regarding the collaborative approach the new CEO is, is taking, uh, closely working with Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, including through the temporary transfer of an experienced CMAL staff member to Ferguson's management team. Secondly, the Scottish Government must look at how ferry procurement, management and delivery can be reformed to improve transparency and accountability within the tripartite agreement between Transport Scotland, CMAL and CALMAC. Project Neptune explored how institutional arrangements can be improved, although, frankly, I believe CMAL and CALMAC should merge, a suggestion I first made in 2007. Finally, the Scottish Government, which has invested over £2.2 billion in ferry services, vessels and infrastructure since 2007, despite Labour's 36 per cent cut in capital allocation in the last year of the dying Brown Government, continued with the Tories with a decade of austerity, must, we must continue to provide vital funding for our ports and vessels to improve services. And I welcome the announcement of at least £580 million to 2026, and no Mr Simpson's calls for £1.4 billion now, over Gibson. the next 10 years. But it would be interesting to see some detail on where the extra money would come from, given capital funding from the UK government will be cut by 9.7 per cent next financial year alone, and the silence of the Tories on this matter during budget deliberations. Thank you, Only Mr Gibson. I now call on Stuart McMillan to be followed by Paul Sweeney for up to six minutes, please. President officer, thank you very much. Uh, President officer, I have said in this chamber before, and I have also said to uh, anyone I talk to about the Yard, that my loyalty is to the Yard, its workforce and also its future. And two weeks ago, when I was in the town, uh, one of the gents who actually works at the yard, uh, he, I was chatting away to him about a number of things, about the yard in particular, and he actually said to me that he's embarrassed to say that he works at the yard. Now, for anyone who works in a, in a facility, to turn and say they're embarrassed to work there, uh, I find that absolutely abhorrent, to say the least. So, this report that we've got uh, in front of us today, I welcome this report. It's independent, it's impartial, and nobody can say that the Audit Scotland and the Auditor General are anything other than that. Sometimes uh, the Audit Scotland reports are not comfortable reading, and this isn't a comfortable reading, but it's independent, it's impartial, and I welcome it. I'm going to reference the sections from it. I also want to highlight, in 2014, I didn't expect the yards to go into liquidation. In 2019, I didn't expect the Scottish Government to actually take uh, the yard on, because, once again, it was going to go into liquidation. In the summer of 2021, I didn't expect to be calling for a change of management at the yard. And certainly in this, in 2022, I didn't expect to be in this situation that we're in also. With the yard going to liquidation in 2014, that was a huge blow to the workforce and also to the Port Glasgow and Inverclyde community. I welcomed the new ownership of the yard and I was thankful for them for coming in. They not only saved 
the existing jobs so that they managed to help build the yard workforce back up. And I will be forever grateful to them for doing that. They also installed an apprenticeship scheme for the first time in many, many years. And with this, they brought in the first ever female apprentice on the tools. But just think about that. that just let that sink in for one moment. Now, once again, I will be forever grateful uh, to the owners at the time for installing that apprenticeship scheme. And with these actions underway, as reported in the Audit Scotland report, there clearly were other issues going on behind the scenes and also with the fabrication of the vessels. Now, page 10 of the report, sections 4 and 5 are actually helpful in this regard. Uh, and uh, just quote a very small bit from section 5. Despite CMAL agreeing to FML's requests to change the contract and the Scottish Government providing financial support, FML entered into administration into August 2019. Uh, sections 18 and 19, that's pages 17 and 18, uh, also kind of go on to highlight. Uh, in early 2017, 18 months after CMAL had awarded the contract, FML complained to CMAL and to the Scottish Minister about the procurement process. That's section 19. Uh, there was no evidence to suggest that the tender documentation was not understood by all bidders. Pre-contract documentation, including FML's bid, suggested that FML was aware of the risks it was accepting at the point of contract award. We move on uh, to the, the time when the Scottish Government it took the, the yard on in 2019. Section 92 of the report, and I quote, the report concluded, and this was in reference to the PwC report, the report concluded that doing nothing would not, uh, would, sorry, I'll say it again, the report concluded that doing nothing would likely result in the insolvency of FML. So, in 2019, if the Scottish Government did not stand, step in, if they did not go in to save the yard, the yard was going bust. The jobs were being lost. So, in reference to, not, not, hold on a minute, Mr. Simpson, you can sit down a minute. In reference to Mr. Simpson's point earlier on, and also Mr. Green's point earlier on, in 2019, the yard was shutting. The jobs were going. They were going, and the ships certainly would not have been finished. They will be finished. The ships would not have been finished. So, also, sections 96 and 97 are crucial in understanding how the Scottish Government came to own the yard. Fundamentally, the yard was going to shut anyway. The appointment of administrators on 9th of August 2019 highlights that. The Scottish Government also stepped in to fund the £6 million wage bill whilst it was in administration. This shows us the commitment of the Scottish Government to actually help keep the yard open and support the workforce. Section 99 of the report also highlights this. And I quote, this meant that the Scottish Government made the decision to nationalise the shipyard without a full and detailed understanding of the amount of work required to complete the vessels, the likely costs, or the significant operational challenges of, at the yard. Now, I don't see how that actually can be a surprise to anybody, bearing in mind the other aspects highlighted in this section, in addition to section 3 and page 4. And I quote, that this internationally recognised contract places full responsibility and risk for the design and build of the vessels with the shipbuilder and does not allow the buyer to intervene in the running of the project. Thus, if relationships are broken down, a lack of information has been shared by, uh, and also by law, uh, the buyer, ultimately the taxpayer, the Scottish Government and its agencies, uh, were not allowed to intervene in the running of the project, then I genuinely fail to see what more the Scottish Government could have done to obtain more information. Now, I want to go into CMAL for one brief moment. CMAL have come for a huge amount of criticism in recent years. And looking at the Audit Scotland report today, I sincerely hope that the CMAL staff can actually feel a sense of some of the weight actually being lifted from their shoulders, uh, because of everything that's actually been thrown at them. Uh, they, are, they obviously have a part to play, but they're no means the core of the problem that's happened over the last, last few years. They are skilled people, they've got the expertise, and also they've got vast experience, and they know what they're doing. And the fact that the Audit Scotland report highlights uh, the, their increasing role uh, in, with the Yard going forward, I think, is welcome. And my final point, presenting all that, is on the workforce. The workforce at the Yard know what they're doing. Uh, and the, the two shop stewards at the Yard know the Yard inside out, back to front. And the Audit Scotland report talks about the additional investment required to make it competitive. And prior to FML, it was a shipyard in name, but it was actually a living, working museum. There had been a complete lack of investment in the yard for decades, despite the ships that had been launched at the yard. Uh, no investment had been put into that yard for decades. So uh, I, I, I know that the, the workforce, they know the skill set that's there. And I would encourage, I would encourage the new uh, chief executive to certainly work with 
the, the shop stewards work with all the workforce and not sideline them that happened in the past. Thank, Thank you, you Mr much. McMillan. Thank you. We now call Paul Sweeney to be followed by Jenny Minto for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Today's debate is long overdue, and I'd like to thank Mr Simpson for bringing it to the Chamber and also giving Audit Scotland's report. It's also a timely one. Uh, the ongoing saga at Ferguson's can only be described as a national scandal, much like many of their ill-fated industrial interventions since the Scottish Government took over the yard. It's been mishap after mishap. It all started in 2015 when ministers awarded that £97 million fixed price contract for two ferries. Despite the government's own procurement agency, Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, CMAL, being hostile to the shipbuilder, rather than there being a Team Scotland national approach to re-establishing commercial shipbuilding on the Clyde, this attitude bred a toxic relationship and long-running feud which ministers steadfastly refused to intervene in, despite direct pleas from the shipyard management to the First Minister to appoint independent arbiters. This culminated, of course, in the shipyard going into administration and a botched government takeover, which has left the taxpayer with a £25 million exposure due to CMAL forfeiting an insurance bond with HCC Insurance and then being successfully sued by the insurance company. And when I raised this in June 2021, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance claimed that I had rewritten history uh, and that she could not comment on the ongoing legal dispute. Well, in January, the court found in favour of the insurers. Uh, and in response to a written question about the same issue, the Cabinet Secretary told me I had rewritten history, accepted that, and I quote, Scottish ministers accept the summary judgment in the English court proceedings. It was a botched takeover that was allowed to, by the failure to complete the Glen Sannox to cost, quality or schedule, meaning that it was launched in 2017 in a low state of outfit, with no bridge windows and a bulbous bow so defective that it has since had to be removed and replaced. Her sister ship, hull number 802, planned to be launched in 2018, is still on the slipway, and no sign, sorry, I can't take intervention, sorry, uh, sign of uh, a firm launch date in sight. Audit Scotland now estimate the two ferries will cost £240 million, two and a half times the original price, and the company ran a £100 million loss in its first year of state ownership. And to add to this insult to this grievous injury, how have we, in the embarrassing situation now, of a contract for the two newest ferries for Scotland's publicly owned ferry operator being awarded to a shipyard in Turkey instead of Scotland's publicly owned shipyard, which didn't even make the final shortlist? All the while, Tim Hare, who held the job of turnaround director at Ferguson's without a hint of irony, was pocketing £2,500 a day, more than the managing director of BE Systems, the UK's most successful and largest shipbuilding company. Deputy Presiding Officer, there has been numerous changes of structure, ownership and leadership at Ferguson's, but one thing that has remained consistent throughout the presence of the First Minister. Her fingerprints are all over the botched takeover, all over the disputes between FEML and CMAL, and all over the ever-increasing costs to the taxpayer. So I think it's about time that we heard some contrition on the part of the government and an admission from the First Minister herself that she takes some personal responsibility for the mismanagement instead of claiming that our government was somehow a white knight in what has become the single biggest public procurement disaster in Scottish history. We all know the failings at Ferguson's, but those failings undoubtedly have consequences. They have consequences for our airline communities who are left without these lifeline ferries, for our industrial base and capabilities, and for the local communities around Inverclyde who are left standing idly by while contracts for Scottish ferries are won by overseas competitors. And it's for these reasons that we cannot simply allow Ferguson's to continue along the path it's been on since 2017. We need a strategy that focuses on a workforce plan, a continuous drumbeat of contracts, and an ambition to see shipbuilding in Scotland returned to its former glory as a global player. A recent report by the House of Commons All-Party Parliamentary Group on Shipbuilding and Ship Repair highlighted the workforce challenges facing the sector and recommended that a strategic workforce register is established to create a database of individuals with interests, skills and capabilities relevant to shipbuilding, sustainment and supply chain industries. This would give a focus to a national effort to train up and fill the gaps, managing the workforce across different shipyards on a national basis. Public sector contracts in Scotland alone offer a massive opportunity to anchor a continuous merchant shipbuilding programme. There are 34 vessels in the Calamac fleet with an average lifespan of around 25 years. If Scottish shipyards were to be awarded the contracts for that entire fleet, like the Ministry of Defence do for the naval shipbuilders, it would mean a drumbeat of one new vessel coming out of a Scottish shipyard every nine months. However, at the current replacement rate, it will take 87 years to renew the entire Calamac fleet which is obviously unsustainable. If returning shipbuilding to, in Scotland to its former glory was a genuine ambition of the government, we would not be in the absurd position 
where a national asset like Inch Green Dry Dock, one of the largest in Europe and less than a mile from Ferguson, Ferguson Marine's cramped and antiquated shipyard, is having its potential suppressed by its owners purely to give their Merseyside shipyard subsidiary a competitive advantage. Instead, we have the Scottish Government ministers lauding the creation of 100 jobs in ship scrappage at Inch Green, many of them agency workers and workers on temporary contracts at this vast facility built, built with public money that could feasibly create thousands of highly skilled, well-paid, secure shipbuilding jobs for the local community and the nation. If we are to have any intention of unlocking our potential as a nation, Inch Green should be subject to a compulsory purchase order and heavily invested in as a national shipbuilding asset with Scottish firms like Ferguson Marine, Malin Marine and Dales Marine forming the basis of a national effort to restore commercial shipbuilding at scale on the Clyde in collaboration with naval shipbuilders like BE and Babcock. Deputy Presiding Officer, fundamentally, we need to end the boom and bust, feast and famine approach to shipbuilding that has plagued Scotland for the past decade. For too long, it has been the case that uncertainty and incompetence have dominated the shipbuilding landscape. It is an approach that means there is no confidence to attract the sustained capital investment needed to establish world-class shipyard infrastructure and for a local supply chain ecosystem to flourish. And more importantly, it is an approach that means there is no foundation upon which to recruit and train a younger, skilled workforce that will be the backbone of the industry for decades to come. Scotland has a proud shipbuilding industry. The shipyards on the Clyde have produced world-class vessels, but the government's record on this has not filled me with confidence. They should start to listen to people who know what they're talking about and want Scottish shipbuilding you to succeed. You need to conclude, Mr. And Sneed. then we will start to turn the tide, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed. We have no time in hand now, so uh, members will have to stick to their uh, allocated speaking limits and accommodate uh, interventions in those uh, limits. I now call Jenny Minto to be followed by Donald Cameron. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the MSP with probably the highest number of ferry routes in my constituency and someone who lives on an island, I understand the shortcomings of the service only too well and therefore have a bigger stake in its improvements than most sitting in this chamber. The Minister's apology is very much appreciated. Since May last year, there have been some quick wins. Campervans must book, um, school minibuses get reduced fares, and the Calmac Communities Board have wider responsibilities. Now, these may seem small to those of you who don't live on islands, but they have made a difference. As others, uh, as others have said, the Scottish Government has committed £580 million to fund new ferries and port investments over the next five years. As part of that, on Monday, I travelled uh, just two miles from here to Leith Docks, where the MV Utney is currently being transformed into the MV Loch Frisa to serve the island of Mull. And to respond to Mr Kerr's intervention, um, the capacity on the Corusk was 40 cars, um, the Utney is 34. Um, passenger numbers are down, so yes, there is a reduction. However, this ferry is going to ply the route year round, a request that the island made five years ago, which is now coming into fruition. So, from my perspective, I think that's a good result. As I said, this will provide a welcome addition to that route, as well as re releasing the Corusk to other routes, as the Minister has said. In addition, and this has been talked about as well, there will be two new ferries for Isla. Seamile announced the preferred bidder for this contract earlier this month. The new vessels were bring an almost 40 per cent increase in vehicle and freight capacity on the Isla route, a reduction in emissions, and improve the resilience of the wider fleet. The first vessel is expected to be delivered in October 2024 and will enter service following sea trials and crew familiarisation. The second vessel will follow in early 2025. And there are further projects as well. The small vessel replacement programme, new vessels for the Danoon Gurek Kilcreggan Triangle and other services with the Mull consultation in early stages. However, it will come as no surprise that ferries top my email and are also top of people's agendas in my constituency visits. Importantly, I have many constituents who have ideas as to how the service could be improved and welcome the forthcoming publication of Project Neptune and the opportunity that this will give them to feed into the process. I ask the Transport Minister to listen to their suggestions. On structure, there are strong views about the split roles of CMAL and CALMAC. Now, I need to be clear that this is about the structures and not about the great teams, as Stuart Macmillan highlighted, uh, the great teams of employees in both organisations. 
Another proposal has been to get, to, to get us through the months until the new vessels are ready as hiring a freight boat. It's been suggested that this could be used across several routes, giving different islands benefit. Now, in the last two weeks, I've used CalMAC services to the islands of Butte, Gia and Mull. And I'm pleased to say that all the ferries ran to schedule and I reached destinations on time, if I may. I would like to drop a few pebbles into the water, which I hope the Minister and her team will take account of. On Butte, some children use the ferry as though it's a school bus, school bus service. So with free bus travel for under 22s, could something similar be introduced to ferries? And pensioners have concerns about price rises across the network, exacerbated by the cost of living crisis. On both Butte and Gia, the ferry service is not bookable. Both islands want to keep it this way, but wonder if there's a way to prioritise bookings for local, locals making essential journeys, like hospital appointments or funerals that have been um, mentioned throughout this debate, so they can get off the island and return on the same day. I was on Mull at the weekend and this subject was raised by constituents there too. While over the last few months I've been having similar discussions with the Isla Ferry Group and Carl Mack, leading to meetings with Transport Scotland about an increase in commercial vehicles due to projected increase in whisky production and the impact that this has on the smaller or ad hoc freight carriers and, of course, other travellers. This gets to the nub of the problem. As with the current capacity constraints, there are different co calls for space from residents wanting ease of travel, commercial vehicles serving businesses and also those whose businesses depend on tourists. I am pleased that the Minister has offered to look into this to see if changes can be made, and I am told the Danish island of Samso has an island card which helps with a similar situation. I also attended a joint meeting of Call and Tyree ferry groups, which the Minister referenced. Uh, they have organised meetings with CMAL, CalMAC and Transport Scotland, but feel as though they are hitting a bit of a wall. Their islands have suffered over this winter, going for periods without a ferry. The three storms in quick succession were the perfect storm, alongside the required maintenance schedule that my colleague Jackie Dunbar referenced. I quote from a recent email that I know the Minister has seen. The primary school on coal has run out of heating oil, and the impact on business in Tyree is now running at a rate of £1,450 lost for one guest house. I look forward to discussing these points further with the Minister. I know that the Scottish Government recognises that ferries are an essential part of Scotland's transport network and the quality of our ferry services impacts on all of us. It is good news that the island's connectivity plan is being taken forward through the National Transport Strategy and the Strategic Transport Projects Review, which will also consider other potential options to connect our islands. Engagement and consultation on this will enable substantial public and community input. I know that my constituents are willing and are wanting to get involved, as this is their lifeline service. Finally, on a positive note, if I may, um, whenever Not I travel... Not really, Ms Minto. You're now over time, I'm afraid. Uh, as briefly as possible. I will do it very, very briefly. I when I travel between my home on Isla and the Parliament, or any of my 23 islands, I am constantly impressed by the cheerful, hard work and helpful attitude of ferry crews and port staff. Thank, Thank you. Ms Minto, I now call on Donald Cameron to be followed by Christine Graham for up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm, I'm very pleased to follow Jenny Minto, who made a, 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 reason, a very reasonable and um, moderate speech about the various um, ideas that people bring to the table. And also, can I associate myself with her comments about ferry staff uh, and those who work in ferry ports? Um, let me begin by mentioning an island in, in her constituency, the island of Mull and take you back to Saturday the 12th of March um, this year, uh, barely 11 days ago. Mull is, of course, relatively close to the mainland, still reliant on ferries. It has four routes. One, uh, Craigmuir to Oban, the main one. Uh, two, Tobermory to Kilchone. Three, the Mull to Iona ferry, serving a resilient but small community on Iona. And finally, Fishnish to Loch Arlen, less busy given the long road detour on the mainland, but still a crucial link. Now, here's a picture of ferry services on that day, 11 days ago. All Craigmuir to Oban sailings between 8.15 in the morning to 6.40 in the evening cancelled. All Craigmuir to Oban sailings between 8.15 and 6.40 the day afterwards cancelled. All services between Tobermory and Kilcone cancelled. The Mull-Iona route, the ferry had gone out of service the day before, 
leaving Iona without service since 10 a.m. that morning. And on the Fishnish to Loch Island route, the only one of Mull's routes to the mainland then operating, people had to make do with a smaller replacement vessel which was unable to carry commercial vehicles. One island, one day, one minimal skeletal service. And all due to boats being taken out of service for repairs or other technical reasons. Not due to the weather, not due to COVID, not due to staff shortages. It is a case study of the sheer disarray that constitutes Scotland's ferry service. If this was unusual or abnormal, then people might be willing to grant the Scottish Government some leeway. But the shocking thing is that it's not unusual. It's what qualifies as normal service. It's what people sadly have come to expect. It's what people on our islands have to put up with day in, day out. That's the truly scandalous aspect of this crisis. That's what should shame a government which has had control of the ferry network for a decade and a half. <laughs> Presiding officer, some MSPs here have rightly concentrated on Ferguson Marie's Marine. Others have spoken about CalMac and CMAL. Uh, we've been reminded how CalMac warned the Scottish Government in 2010 that one new ferry was needed every year simply to keep up. And as Edward Mountain said, that now is two and a half ferries every year. Some have spoken about systemic problems, whether that be the incompetent approach to procurement or the ageing fleet itself with over half the boats past their use-by date. However, today I want to talk about the human aspect of all of this. Now, islanders of course accept that their way of life means allowances must be made for disruption to travel on and off the islands. For those who don't need a ferry on a specific day and are able to wait, they can put up with the odd delay and cancellation. But not everyone can wait. Some people need to travel at once and they need a robust and reliable service. The crofter who needs to get livestock to the mart, the seafood business which needs to get live shellfish to market, the patient with a hospital appointment they simply cannot afford to miss, the services and trades that need to get to and from the islands for work, the accommodation providers who stand to lose bookings. Even schooling can be affected. Let me return to Iona. It's been estimated that secondary school pupils from Iona who have to travel to the new high school in Oban have missed out on 30% of their education due to a mixture of cancellations and the unreliability of early and late sailings from Iona. 30%, almost a third of their education provision. And that's before account is taken of the pandemic. And a minister uh, used to be a teacher. Does she think that that's acceptable? Human lives, human stories, people affected every day by this crisis. People who, if things do not improve, will leave. They will leave the islands. They will forsake their lives there, their jobs and their friends. We will have the depopulation, we all know, is such a threat to island life. Particularly for young families of working age, the failing ferry service is now a driver of depopulation. Ariane Burgess was right. She quoted a family from South Eust. This isn't a political point. It's being said the length and breadth of our islands. Let me quote the Ferry, Ferries Communities Board, who recently expressed their concern. They're a neutral body. They simply represent their communities. They said, while we are well used to living with the effects of weather on our ferry services, and more recently COVID, the recent extent and duration of mechanical failures on multiple vessels has led to massive disruption right across the network. Unfortunately, this is unlikely to be a one-off. They carry on with such an ageing fleet in our challenging environment. This represents a real threat to our island's ability to retain and attract people, ensure services are sufficiently reliable and at prices that permit viable communities and thereby avoid depopulation. And I urge the Minister to travel to the islands and listen to the islanders, speak to them. Don't just consult the civil servants and Transport Scotland and Seaman and Calmac and the vast, vast panoply of vested interests here. A year ago, Sorry, a few years ago, this government passed the Island Scotland Act, an act which requires public services to be tested in terms of their impact on island communities. An act which at the time was much trumpeted by the Scottish Government. It would ensure island proofing. Can I suggest that the very first place to start when it comes to island proofing is to sort out the mess which is Scotland's ferry services? And there's a question of responsibility. Willie Rennie was correct. We've hardly had any apologies, and I note and welcome what was said at the start of this debate. We've had no resignations, though, despite this saga lasting years and years. Has anyone in a position of authority ever stepped up and accepted the blame for this? Has anyone in CalMac or CMAL or Transport Scotland ever accepted their role in this fiasco 
Has anyone in government, any one of the many transport ministers, just once taken the blame? To conclude, presiding officer, people can blame the weather, they can blame the pandemic, they can blame the ferry agencies, they can blame the operators. But ultimately, what this constitute, constitutes is a failure of government, this government. A failure to serve those that live and work on every island in Scotland. A failure which will not be forgotten, still less forgiven. And a failure which should belatedly shame this government into taking action. Thank you, Mr Cameron. We now move to the final speaker in the open debate. Christine Graham, up to six minutes, please, Ms Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this late in the debate and my contribution, I'll focus on the actions of P&O and Fire and Rehire, which is referenced in the SNP amendment and has been referenced by some Labour contributors. Let me first pay tribute to my colleague Emma Harper, who would have been here today taking part, but her energies are used elsewhere as she stands shoulder to shoulder with sacked workers at Cairn Ryan, where, as she has rightly said, P&O services are essential to the local economy, critical route for many businesses here in Scotland, Northern Ireland and in Ireland, not only supporting jobs in the port, but in the local businesses, supporting the ferry routes. Incidentally, the local MP, Alistair Jack, reputedly Scotland's man in the Cabinet, has had much of an impact in saying about this, but he hasn't got much of an impact, generally speaking. Now, DP World, the logistics company based in Dubai, as we know, owns P&O. And how many of us knew that before this had happened? He sacked 800 workers online, frog-marched them off vessels to be replaced by cut price agency workers, ruthlessly casting aside workers who tried to keep the company afloat during a pandemic. The thing is, P&O Ferries insists it did not break the law when it fired them without notice or consultation. Rightly here and at UK level, politicians challenged the company's claim that laws were not broken with this shock sacking. And if it turns out it has not broken the law, then it raises questions about UK employment law. The defence may be that all vessels involved were registered outside the UK and the relevant authorities in each case had been notified. Though it may be that under UK employment law, workers' rights are based on the jurisdiction from which you work. In other words, because they work in the UK, they're covered by UK law. On that basis, no consultation and so on, then the law may have been broken. But at the end of the day, even if that's the case, that would be a pyrrhic victory for employees as the legal dispute would be drawn out as they remain jobless, yet still having financial commitments, mortgages, overdrafts and so on also with the possibility of legal costs. There has been a response from the CEO, Peter Hepplethwaite, to Business Secretary Kwasi Kerteng, dated March 22, and I quote, the very clear statutory obligation in the particular circumstances that applied was for each company to notify the competent authority of the state where the vessel is registered. He wrote that notification had been made to the relevant authorities on March 17, and no offence had been committed regarding notifying the Secretary of State. Now, this is relevant, and I'll come to why later. Now, there's been a lot of hand-wringing by Grant Chaps and others, but this is the very Tory government which blocked, just last year, an attempt to pass a law that would deter employers from using fire and rehire tactics to bully workers into lower-paid jobs, and I support Labour colleagues in this matter. In fact, introducing the Employment Trade Union Rights Dismissal and Replacement Engagement Bill to its second reading in the House of Commons, Labour's Barry Gardner said his bill would require businesses to meaningfully consult with their workers and worker representatives when such restructuring is required. I want to make my points. No fire and rehire in shorthand. But during the debate, politicians on all sides of the House appear to agree that fire and rehire was morally wrong. But Conservative MPs pushed back against the need for legislation, saying that updated ACAS guidance to businesses should be enough to tackle the problem. Well, it isn't. The UK government then voted down a closure motion which would have allowed the House to vote for or against the bill and proceeded to filibuster till it ran out of time. Finally, Conservative MP Peter Bone said, it seems to me, this is a quote, seems to me this is talking about something for next year. There are 17 bills to be debated today. Why is it urgent to put this statement on today on private members' time rather than the government? I hope he lives to rue those words. 
Let me conclude, presiding officer, by reminding the Tory benches opposite that of the UK ferry contracts for ferries which did not or could not be delivered. Let us not forget the gormless grayling, previous UK Transport Minister, when ferry contracts signed to ensure critical imports could reach the UK in the event of a no-deal Brexit were cancelled, costing taxpayers a further £50 million. Contracts worth £89 million with Brittany Ferries and DFDS to secure ferry space for vital goods across the Channel were cancelled. According to the National Audit Office, estimates in February this year, the cost of compensation to ferry operators for termination would be up to £56 million. Then, of course, the grand finale, £1 million paid by Chris Galing to consultants for a £14 million contract with Seaborne Freight, which was scrapped. I've emerged. They didn't build ferries. They didn't build ships. They didn't build boats. Now... This is the final part about Grayling. He amended the UK legislation in 2018 so that the Secretary of State did not have to be notified of mass redundancies on ships registered overseas. I wonder why. So it could be that P&O are off the legal hoop thanks to Grayling. With that kind of track record, they'll soon be knighted in the House of Lords where they put all their failed ministers. Thank you, Ms. Graham. I would just remind the Chamber that name-calling is, is not necessary uh, in these debates, and uh, I now call on Rhoda Grant for up to six minutes, Ms. Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I associate myself with Neil Bibby's comments about P&O? Our ferry workers provide lifeline services and should not be treated like this. And I would also like to pay tribute to CalMAC workers who also provide lifeline ferry services. They, nor the workers in Ferguson's, are responsible for the situation we find ourselves in. Let us be clear, the blame for the ferry fiasco lies squarely at the door of the Scottish Government. CMAL told them in no uncertain terms that the FMEL contract they were entering into was a huge risk and they ignored them. Scottish ministers decided to steamroll her on and as Graham Simpson said, we still don't know why because the decision and the reasons were not documented. This was a decision that involved an estimated £97 million of public money and we don't have a properly documented reasoning. That decision has now cost two and a half times as much and not even a rowboat to show for it. Only Jackie Dunbar can see that as an achievement. The Minister must tell us today why these decisions were made. This lack of transparency is absolutely unacceptable. This is not just about an incompetent government who squandered public money while taking selfies on front of ferries with painted on windows. This is about the communities they serve. People cannot get to hospital or go to funerals. People who watch businesses fail because they cannot get the product, their product off island. It's government's responsibility to boost the economy, not kill it. Ariane Burgess talked about the three families leaving US. They will not be on their own because of the ferry fiasco. Some businesses are losing thousands of pounds with each failed sailing. Others, on a much smaller scale, but they're losing their weekly income because of race and facing raising costs at the same time. Katie Clark talked about the need for communities to be involved in planning the ferry fleet. And if they had been involved, we wouldn't be in this mess now. CalMAC have suffered one of the worst winters in their history. They've had to do it with one hand tied behind their back. Creaky vessels with frequent technical breakdowns Vessels that are not equipped for changing climate and worsening weather. Infrastructure that doesn't allow flexibility to deploy vessels where they are needed. Not enough funding to allow ferries to operate at full capacity, even, placing, even facing COVID impacts and accruing aside. I'm advised that CalMAC alone would require a minimum of £7 million additional funding just to employ the crew they would need to be able to meet demand. The Minister cannot pass the buck to CalMAC. Their action plan would include both boats and crew, and that is being withheld by the Scottish Government. 
The Scottish Government blames the weather, but if they have the wrong boats in the wrong place, then they cannot sail in bad weather. As Neil Bibby said, our communities deserve a public inquiry into how they have been failed so catastrophically over Hulls 801 and 802. Add to this the exposure by, to, uh, highlighted by Paul Swinney that the government still faces. It's not good enough for the Scottish Government to blame everyone else, where the blame uh, sits squarely at their door. And the apology today is welcome, but in giving it, the Minister continues to deflect blame. Graeme Simpson highlighted the average age of the fleet, which the Scottish Government were aiming to take down to 12 and a half years, but it has soared to over 25 years. And Katie Clark pointed out that 25 years is the accepted operational life of a ferry. And so she said the operational issues are due to the ageing fleet and not um, due to CalMAC. And, maybe, and that is maybe why CMAL are tendering for two new ferry engines, because the ones they replace are obsolete and you can't procure replacement parts for them. The Scottish Government have no strategy, no plan, and a set of ministers that have proven themselves at best naive, most likely incompetent or worse. Willie Rennie pointed out that this incompetence is not just reserved to ferry procurement, but it runs through the SNP government like a stick of rock. They have not sa saved Ferguson's, but they've damaged them. And my heart goes out to the worker that Stuart Macmillan talked about. The Scottish Government has a duty to restore the reputation of the yard and safeguard these jobs, as highlighted by Paul Sweeney. In order to have an adequate fleet, one that meets the bare minimum of community needs, we should be launching a new vessel every two years. Today, the Cabinet Secretary for, for Finance refused to guarantee that those two new ferries would come into operation and refused to take responsibility if they did not. Presiding officer, we need a streamlined and effective strategy. Instead, we have a planning and operation that is split across multiple quangos and operators, so the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, overseen by an incompetent government. Our communities are beyond desperate. They deserve better. It's time for the First Minister to take control. Thank you. And I call on Jamie Halker Johnston to wind up. Up to apologies, Mr. Halker Johnston. I call on Kate Forbes to, to wind up. Up Thank to seven you, minutes, officer. I don't know if that was a promotion or, or otherwise, so um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to start by echoing my colleague in her apology to island communities and also start by paying tribute to the hard work of all the staff who support our ferry networks, the people who work in all weathers and throughout the restrictions imposed by COVID-19 to ensure that our lifeline services provide a reliable and a resilient service to the communities they serve. It goes without saying, and many have said it this afternoon, that ferries are a lifeline. For our island communities, they are the equivalent of uh, a road or otherwise in more urban areas. Our island communities rely on them for access to employment, for health provision, for education, and to see their loved ones. And we've heard anecdotes this afternoon to that effect. They are also essential to support a vibrant and growing tourism sector and sustaining local businesses, enabling the distribution of products and providing vital supplies to support local trade. I've emphasised at several points this afternoon my own constituency and the islands within my own constituency. Why? Because I understand the impact directly. And if Jenny Minto's emails uh, refer to uh, serve, uh, ferry services on a regular basis, uh, so also do mine. In fact, Donald Cameron's illustration referenced several locations within uh, my own constituency. Uh, Jenny Minto talked about the MV Loch Frita, which would uh, secure the return of the MV Krusk to the Malig Armadale route. And that is an example of uh, an improvement to the service, which certainly my constituents have been waiting on for a number of years and will considerably improve the resilience on the Malig Armadale route this summer. We're working on the small vessel replacement programme, new vessels for Danoon and Kilcreggan, further major vessel replacements for Mull and South Uist, and replacement freight trips for Orkney and Shetland. Yeah. 
Jamie Hogger Johnston. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. As my colleague Edward Mountain highlighted, the deal with Ferguson's uh, was based on a fixed price with milestone payments, but obviously that price spiralled out of control. We've seen the delays and, and heard all about it today. Chief Executive Seamal advised me this week that relating to the agreement with the Turkish Yard, the contract has been agreed on a fixed price basis and also the agreed milestone payments. So what's going to be different this time? Well, we have learned a number of lessons from the previous procurement, and those are well documented. Um, and uh, as the member has just referenced, uh, the fact that, for example, full refund guarantees are embedded in future contracts. Back to the communities, though. Over the next four years, we will introduce four major vessels to the um, Clyde and Hebrides uh, network. Glen Sanex and Hull 802 are expected to be in service from summer uh, 2023 and winter 2023-24. The Isla Vessel 1 is expected in, summer for, uh, in service sorry, from summer 2024, and Isla Vessel 2 from winter 2024-25. And in addition, as already been referenced, MV Lochfrita is on course to be deployed on the Craigmuir Open Route from May this year. I'd quite like to make some progress and I have limited uh, time. I want to pay particular tribute to uh, four uh, constituency MSPs, Jenny Minto, Alistair Allen, Kenny Gibson and Stuart McMillan. Because Jenny Minto, Alistair Allen uh, Kenny Gibson all represent constituencies that rely on ferry yep. Yep. routes. They met Jenny Gilruth, the Transport Minister, last week, and they directly represent their constituents robustly. They are not slow in representing the views that constituents pose to them. They are also actively involved in looking for solutions to the problems that their constituents face. Alistair Allen has already raised the point about the need to engage more with communities, suggestions and solutions that are being progressed. He's also raised the issue of the need for more capacity in the Western Isles, particularly whilst Uig to Tarbert service is out of action later this year. Jenny Minto talked about the fact that as an islander, the stakes for her in getting these issues resolved are particularly high. She talked about uh, Butte children who are using the ferry as a bus service. Uh, the fact that constituents do want to get truly involved in the decision process, a point that's been made a number of times by Katie Clark as well and Rhoda Grant, which um, I would agree with. And also the need to balance the different users of those vessels, islanders, businesses and visitors, and how that can be better managed. Presiding officer, we've already spoken at length about Ferguson Marine. And I wanted to use some of my time this afternoon to talk about that again, because I've already set out uh, the scale of the challenge, but also our commitment to progress uh, further. Progress has not been as fast as we would have liked, but we are progressing further. In terms of the importance of uh, the workers in the yard, uh, many people have paid uh, tribute to the workers uh, in the yard. And I think uh, Stuart McMillan has been frequent in his representation of the workers' views and particularly the shop stewards' views uh, in ways that I think have actually delivered uh, results. The call for a closer working relationship with CMAL, the importance of having a pipeline of talent through the apprenticeship scheme, of ensuring that leadership is ultimately accountable. Those shop stewards, those workers, they know the yard, they know their trade. And I can assure them that Stuart McMillan represents them and their interests vigorously eh, to me, certainly. There has been talk, lastly, presiding officer, about the need for significant increased investment in ferries and ferry procurement. And I am always open, as the Chamber knows, to additional asks for budget. I am happy to be corrected, but I cannot think of a single time in the last three budgets that I have introduced when either the Conservatives or the Labour Party have made additional ferry funding a key requirement. The exception to that, to be fair, is the Liberal Democrats and obviously uh, SNP members. So I look forward to next year's budget, presiding officer, not knowing who will be taking it forward, to hear from the Labour Party and the Conservatives additional funding for our ferries front and centre of their asks. As I close, uh, presiding officer, we recognise the work that needs to be done, the importance of the ferries, ensuring that there is a robust 
and renowned shipbuilding industry here in Scotland. This debate has fleshed out these issues in more detail, and I look forward to progressing those issues with Jenny Gilruth. Thanks. Thank you. And I now call on Jamie Halker Johnston to wind up. Up to eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As an islander, um, particularly today's debate um, has been an important one, and it has been illuminating, although I suspect not in the way the Scottish Government would have hoped. For far too many years now, there has been a slow blazing fire where a Scottish Government ferry strategy should be. That has had real impact, not only in my own region, the Highlands and Islands, but across other parts of Scotland too. We are all guilty of sometimes looking too much at the symptoms. We are annoyed by cancellations, we get upset over the impact on the econ economic recovery of our communities. Or, as many have done today, we, we focus on the most obvious rusting reminders of ministerial failure, failure that sit unfinished on the bank of the Clyde. The Glen Sanox, as Edward Mountain highlighted, its wooden windows and fake funnels, launched with a fanfare which must now make even this First Minister cringe with embarrassment. And as Neil Bibby said, ministers should stop heading down there. We are very quick to head down there when there were PR ops. Not so much now, though. And while we must also take a real look at the causes and solutions, underlying it all is a Scottish Government that has taken remote and island communities for granted. A Government that has, more than any other in the history of devolution, shied away from structural change in favour of showmanship. One that has placed long-term problems, problems that need big solutions, in the too difficult pile. Now, after almost a decade and a half in power, the consequences of that approach are showing in almost every part of our lives today. Too many examples of those consequences have come from around the Chamber today. What I want to emphasise, however, is the impact that that has on the lives of communities that ferries serve. I mentioned recovery, and this is a key area. At vital parts of this two-year pandemic, businesses and workers have sought to get things back on track, to bring in money when they could, often after long periods of being unable to operate at all. But too often, communities have been hampered in that recovery by the problems with their ferry links. For some parts of our economy, this has been a longer-standing problem, one which has seen some of our most fragile communities left behind by choices made for them here in Edinburgh. And for some, it has meant poorer access to public services, as others have highlighted, islands having to miss rarely available appointments on the mainland because of lack of transport options. And while isolation has been one of the worst parts of this pandemic for many people, for some folk reliant on an unreliable network, that isolation was made worse. There has yet to be a clear strategic look at Scotland's ferries in the round. The Scottish Government has attempted to answer concerns in a piecemeal and short-termist way. Often it has, folk, it has broken promises on fair funding, on RET in the Northern Isles. First we get the pledges, then they become ambitious targets, and finally aspirational dates in the diary to be conveniently forgotten. Our islands have too often seen ministers visit, make promises, and then have watched those promises sail away off into the sunset never to be met. If only the ferry network was that predictable. This will take an entirely different approach to resolve. We are calling today for an inquiry into the repeated failures to make provision for renewing our ageing fleet. Above all, we need to examine the sustainability of the fleet in delivering current levels of service. We know that not only are the franchise fleets in need, but also those, those operated by the two local authorities in Orkney and Shetland. At the same time, any strategic examination of ferries must also make credible estimate of the costs and advantages of fixed links. Colleagues will know that these fixed links can take a number of forms and could be part of a key transport network in the Northern Isles, as Willie Rennie highlighted. And where real benefit can be demonstrated, which I believe in many cases it can be, we should get on with the job of building sooner rather than later. And we must be realistic about the needs of our ferry fleet going forward to be able to review and set out needs for the coming years and decades. That will take a level of honesty and commitment to funding and to the sort of contingencies that are essential in operations such as these. As we look forward to reducing carbon emissions, where do our ferries stand in that question? The Scottish Government can hardly claim to have any role of leadership when we're buying up uh, vessels from abroad, disposed of as they switch to renewable alternatives. Norway aims to have an entirely electric car ferry fleet by 2025. Where will Scotland stand at that point? We know that the Scottish Government's decision to buy the Northern Isles boats has put them even further away from their targets on reduced emission ve vessels. And at the heart of these decisions must be the communities themselves. The future of routes of provision of resourcing should not be decisions taken in St Andrew's House or within 
Transport Scotland alone. It should not be left up to ministers or officials who, understandably, communities have little confidence in. They should be made with a consultation and collaboration of people who depend on ferries. But that simply does not appear to be on the agenda of this Government, as highlighted by the local council, where the Western Isles still has no one on the board of CalMac, the very op operator which provides vital lifeline services to those islands. Presiding officer, there have been a number of notable contributions. Today, my colleague Graham Simpson highlighted that NASA designed and built rockets to go to the moon's sea of tranquility, quicker than it's taken the SNP to build a replacement ferry to get to Tarbert. He also highlighted two figures relating to how much need is needed to invest in our ferries fleet. Former Transport Minister Graham Day has reported to have suggested it would take $1.5 billion over 10 years, and our figure is an estimate of $1.4 billion. Edward Mountain noted that Scotland now needs to build two and a half ferries every single year for 10 years just to get back on track, but also that there isn't, but also that, that there isn't an inherent issue with the Scottish shipbuilding or with contracts from government, because yards in Scotland have in the last few years alone delivered two aircraft carriers for the Royal Navy and are currently producing Type 26 and Type 31 frigates for the, for the UK Government. Speaking about the ferries at Ferguson's, Jamie Green rightly highlighted that despite the endless failures, the delays, the cost increases, the people and communities let down, no one in this SNP Government has been held to account. And my colleague Donald Cameron spoke passionately about the deg degradation of the service that the Western Isles have come to expect and its potential to further the problem of depopulation and the impact on school children on, on Iona of unri unreliable ferry links with Oban. Presiding officer, there has been a growing crisis in our ferry services for some time now. A programme of recovery will be one which stands with strand of sorting things out. But as we have made clear, it will not be the only action that is needed. Again, we need a long-term strategic approach to ensure that these services remain su sustainable, remain operational and can improve for the communities we serve. I hope the Minister and her colleagues have noted the many examples outlined today. And I hope that the Cabinet Secretary recognises and accepts that this is good, not good enough now and that it is getting worse. And our constituents are watching. They are desperate for better from this Government. And so I hope every MSP from across this chamber, every MSP who genuinely cares about the future of those communities reliant on ferries, will support our motion today. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Scotland's ferries. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 3768 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to tomorrow's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 3768 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 3746 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and once again moved. Thank you. Again, no member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 3746 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 3750 on approval of an SSI. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. And moved, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, this instrument sees the Scottish Government raise disability benefits by just 3.1 per cent, in lockstep with the Department of Work and Pensions. That is 3 per cent behind the inflation figures announced this morning, and potentially 5 per cent behind the inflation figures experts are predicting. That is going to hit people directly in their pockets. People with disabilities often have equipment such as electric wheelchairs and mobility scooters that gobble up electricity. With fuel prices soaring, they face real hardship. This decision is going to push more people into poverty. We have called for the UK Government to lift disability benefits, but it is not good enough for the SNP and Green Government to say it has to move 
with the UK Government on this, because people were promised a better system seven years ago. I argued for more powers for this Parliament. All parties supported the devolution of Social Security powers worth £4 billion. Only Scottish, min Scottish ministers continue to ask the DWP to run the system for them under their agency agreement, because the Scottish Government still is not ready. This is a failure on its part to use the full powers of devolution. It has left people with the DWP for years and years. The result of this is that people are at the sharp end of the cost of living crisis, seeing support drop potentially five points behind inflation. I am glad the Scottish Government is lifting the number of devolved benefits by 6 per cent. I only wish the Scottish and UK Governments were doing the same for the disability benefits that thousands rely upon. For that reason, Scottish Liberal Democrats cannot vote for this SSI this evening. Thank you. I call on Ben McPherson, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I'm sure Mr Rennie will welcome the launch of adult disability payment uh, first pilot phase on Monday and appreciate the position as we launch this disability benefit after successfully launching child disability benefit. We are also currently undertaking the transfer of those in Scotland who are receiving disability benefits from the UK Government Department for Work and Pensions into Social Security Scotland in a safe and secure way. And while that process is undertaken, we cannot create a two-tier system where individuals paid by Social Security Scotland are paid more than clients whose cases have not yet transferred to the Scottish system. That transfer will be undertaken as quickly, but also as safely and securely as possible. Signing officer, the order under consideration today operates benefits for which we have executive competence, uh, but which are currently administered by the DWP under agency agreement on behalf of Scottish ministers as we undertake safe and secure transfer. These include attendance allowance, disability living allowance, carers allowance, industrial injuries scheme benefits, personal independence payment and severe disablement allowance. Presiding officer, we have no discretion around the level by which we increase these benefits. The agency agreements in place with the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, which allow the WP to deliver these benefits on behalf of Scottish ministers, mean that we are committed to uprate these benefits at the same rate as the DWP does. Therefore, uh, they are operated by 3.1% in line with the September CPI. It is a matter for Scottish ministers to make an order affecting the uprate, uh, which is what you see before Parliament today. Uh, I was disappointed, uh, as uh, others were, that the Chancellor did not take the opportunity today to further increase benefits to support people who need it most to deal with the rising living costs. In contrast, the Scottish Government is acting to help households. Uh, with the Scottish benefits, where we have discretion to go further, we are acting urgently in response to growing cost of living pressures, and we will provide additional support by further increasing several forms of devolved social security benefits and assistance from 3.1 per cent instead to 6 per cent in separate regulations, uh, which will be before the Social Justice and Social Security Committee on the 31st of March. Thank you. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions, and I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 3747 to 3749 on approval of SSIs. Thank you, President Officer, and all moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first is that Amendment 3712.2 in the name of Jenny Gilruth, which seeks to amend Motion 3712 in the name of Graham Simpson on Scotland's ferries, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.